superintendent remotely. Evelyn Ibaya Isaiah, Ben Blumenthal, Kira Cook, Ginny Kremer, Tessa McKinley, John Peterson, Nora Schein, Andrew Schwartz, and myself. Yevin Wang will be absent this evening. In an effort to make our meetings as secure as possible, members of the public may view the meeting using Acton TV's YouTube channel found at the top of the agenda. Those who wish to comment during the meeting were asked to register prior to the start of the meeting using the link also found at the top of our agenda. These procedures are posted on our public participation policy, BEDH. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on Acton TV's website and also at actontv.org. Uh, per our remote policy, we're back to all votes being done by roll call. I will call each member's name and they will state how they vote. Thank you for joining us. Um, we do have a packed agenda this evening and I look forward to some productive discussions. Uh, since we are back in the virtual setting, please have some patience with us as we work to remember where our mute buttons might be located and as we bring guests and members of the public in and out of our meeting. Uh, and for members of the committee, remember that as we're doing roll call votes, I plan on calling you in alphabetical order, so be prepared to unmute yourself. Uh, moving on to uh, the ABRHS student representatives updates, we will bring in uh, Dupree Carr, Sivapriya, and Rohan. So give us just a sec. I brought in Dupree. I'm looking for everyone else. Rohan and Sivapriya, if you could raise your hands just so ah. we could find you if you're here. Oh, there's Rohan. Thank you. And I don't see Sivapriya. Neither do I. Okay. All right. Good evening, Dupree and Rohan. Take it away. Hello. Hello, so I'll start tonight. Um, all right, let me move this over here. Okay. So the COVID wave in our school, which I'm sure will be talked about extensively today, uh, has certainly been a challenge for students. And from personal experience, there seems to be less flexibility in the classroom around doing group work and switching seats. And this change appears to affect world language classes the most, where speaking the language uh, with others is the most important part of the class. I've also noticed that my teachers are under more stress to try and accommodate for students who are out with COVID, because it's certainly tough to teach in-person lessons to both an in-person class and remote students um, tuning in from home. And those students have also been put under more stress as they try to keep up with school from home. But as far as the actual COVID and safety measures have been, I believe the community, especially the teachers and staff, has stepped up to the challenge of trying and bringing our cases down. When things got bad, rather than complaining about our situation, the majority of students complied and continued to comply with mask wearing protocols set by the district. In the high school, we can trace this trend directly back to the hard work the staff who have been working so diligently um, have been doing, and especially when they remind us to keep our masks on and to sit far away from each other at lunch. As students now more than ever, or well, now more than at least last month, we've been wearing our masks more often. We've been wearing more protective ones. We still do have some trouble distancing ourselves at lunch, but we're working on it. Ultimately, students and teachers are trying their absolute best to keep the school safe. And now we just have to hope that cases come down. And I'll hand it off to Dupree from here. Yeah, I would just like to also mention my uh, my gratitude to the staff who've been working very diligently and have been a massive help. Um, I still see, uh, at least anecdotally, some students still not wearing their masks properly uh, above their mouth and nose. And it is certainly better than it was about a month ago where it was more common. So the reminders and the diligence from staff has been helpful, um, though it is still a bit of a problem. And distancing during lunch is, as Rohan mentioned, still uh, not ideal. But um, other than that, uh, it seems as though 
uh, people are taking this more seriously than they were uh, in the weeks before. And that's a good change. Excellent. Thank you, Dupree. Thank you, Rahan. Any questions or comments? All right. Seeing none, um, we will move on to the public participation. Uh, if members of the public who are pre-registered would like to speak about an item that is not on our agenda, please raise your hands in Zoom so we can be recognized, uh, so you can be recognized and you'll be allowed to speak for up to three minutes. Uh, Tessa, I'll ask if you could keep track of the time, please. And uh, we will see some hands come up. All right, Sarah, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Sarah Coletti from Willow Street in Acton. Uh, I speak as a resident uh, and community member tonight. I'm also chair of Not Say, the social justice group at Congregation Beth Elohim, but I'm not speaking on behalf of that group tonight. I stand with all of you in wanting our students to be welcomed and supported and given every opportunity to thrive in our schools. In these times, that means there must be a school official who has the responsibility, the power, and resources to develop and enforce policies that address bias-motivated incidents. I believe that to be one of the jobs under the purview of the Assistant Superintendent for Equity and Inclusion, but that position is being eliminated. I want to understand how the schools will address bias-motivated incidents in the future. The agenda for tonight's meeting had a crossed-out presentation on AB protocols for responding to incidents involving hate or bias. That issue still needs to be presented to the community. Uh, because I have been concerned with incidents I have heard about in the schools, I downloaded and read the School Hate Crime Resource Guide, which is available on the Massachusetts Municipal Association website. It offers specific recommendations and resources for schools and families, as well as data about incidents in the state and the country. I encourage everyone to read this. To understand and address bias-motivated incidents, we need these incidents to be reported and tracked. The recent change to allow anonymous reporting at the high school is a good step. Too often, the, those reporting incidences or those targeted suffer the consequences of being sidelined or disbelieved. Reporting an incident often requires a person to overcome peer pressure to let it go. One minute. Incidents need to be tracked. Schools also must track and report both. Schools already track and report bullying incidents. Extending the capacity to do so for incidents that target people due to race, religion, gender, or sexual or orientation is not a stretch. This information is important to share with the community groups and officials who endeavor to improve response and prevention. Building a community where all students can be welcome requires more than a school policy or a school administrator. It requires ongoing transparency and communication between the school and the community about those policies and personnel. It requires accountability for progress. I ask for clarity on who will be accountable for developing policy on reporting, responding and tracking bias motive incidents, and who will be responsible for communicating to the greater community Fine. development with regards to diversity and equity. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, anybody else from the member of the public who wishes to speak on an item that is not on this evening's agenda, please raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move over to the superintendent's update, which I believe is going to be presented as part of our budget update and COVID protocols update. Right, Peter? Yeah, that's correct. We're actually going to skip over the superintendent's update in this meeting as a general update, um, and we're going to save that until we get to the COVID update and then uh, budget. Great. Thank you. So we'll move on to our presentations. First presentation this evening um, is on the high school science course overview. 
Um, and as a reminder, uh, in our agenda, we've listed the two goals in our district strategy that this relates to. Um, I think we have brought uh, David Baumritter up as a panelist. There he is. Um, welcome, David. Hi, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to come in and talk about the work that we've been doing over the last uh, couple of years. Um, I do want to just share that we have um, shared this presentation with our, our leadership team at the high school, um, our counseling department specifically, um, faculty and staff. Um, we've also shared this with the um, eighth grade science teachers and leadership at the junior high as well. Um, we've gotten some student feedback, uh, both written and in focus groups. Um, and next week we have a um, webinar set up to share with uh, students and family in the community um, in the greater community. So um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, if, if we can um, just kind of let you know where we are in terms of getting started, the way that this work uh, kind of came about was um, currently we have our eighth grade students that um, some of which take earth and environmental science and some of which take honors biology. Um, we've tracked data uh, over a three-year period uh, that indicated that our students that didn't do as well in, in honors biology um, tended to uh, struggle as um, they moved through their four-year science curriculum. And so um, the messaging that it was sharing with families um, eighth grade into ninth grade um, was to just really be thoughtful um, in terms of uh, opting for honors biology if that was an option for them. Um, and that we're explaining, you know, that there's the balance in terms of the now versus doors open for the future and that there was potential, and I'll say risk in whatever way you want to um, uh, frame that um, for students in, in terms of their curriculum. And um, over time, it uh, came to, to me, my thinking that, you know, why do we have a system that's set up where we have to um, describe to students and families with these caveats and saying, well, this might be a more challenging path than another and so forth. Um, so we put together a group in January of 2020, um, science teachers, and we did a um, program review, which is similar to kind of an audit, um, a snapshot in time of, of where we were at that particular time. Um, we had generated a few, uh, about seven goals, I believe, and really narrowed that down to two goals. Next slide, please. Uh, the first goal was to create a science sequence with improved access to advanced coursework. Uh, next, please. Um, Did I get? There we go. Sorry. Yeah, there we go. Um, and so part of the design for the new sequence is so that we will have an opportunity to shift some of this decision making um, in terms of when students are, are able to stretch, stretch academically. Uh, not when they can stretch, but in terms of that stretch academically from 8th to ninth to ninth to 10th grade. Um, and you'll see as we have things set up in that, how we've done that. Um, anecdotally, uh, teachers over the last number of years reporting that our ninth grade students that were in the honors biology course, which is primarily a 10th grade course, um, had more social emotional challenges. Um, and... Uh, and so we wanted to try to put together a sequence that was going to be in line with some of the uh, social emotional beliefs that our district has for our students. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so one other issue that, that came up, and this is where it's sort of that risk piece comes in, is that students that um, found honors biology challenging, they may have gone on to do chemistry the next year and then take an AP course as a junior. Um, for those students that struggled in that AP course, um, there was no place for them to go. And so students would either stay in the class and really struggle through, um, or they would maybe drop the class altogether and have to wait until second semester to pick up a half year elective. Um, and I think for many of the students, that wasn't necessarily the pathway that they expected and the kind of experience that they expected when they were coming into high school in ninth grade. Um, so the new proposal that we have um, has um, what I'll call a safety net um, for students so that there's a place for students to go. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of this improved access, um, the way that we're going to set it up is that the first year, or AP Biology will be offered in 10th grade as a first year course. Uh, currently, um, it is a second year biology class. 
Um, and the same will be the case with AP Chemistry. So that all of our juniors will be taking chemistry, um, and AP Chemistry uh, would be offered as a first-year class there as well. Um, this also allows students for uh, the opportunity to, let's say, try AP Bio and stretch as a sophomore, um, if things aren't working out for them, that there would be a place for them to go into a non-AP biology class. Um, and they would have the opportunity to take AP bio try AP biology again as a junior or as a senior. Um, and that would be true for AP chemistry as well, that students could try that as a senior um, if that was something that um, they were struggling with in their, in their junior year. Um, the new sequence would allow for students to take uh, three AP science classes without having to double up. Right now, all of our AP classes are offered only in junior and senior year. Um, so by offering AP biology in 10th grade, students have the opportunity to take AP bio in 10th grade, AP chem in 11th grade, and um, AP physics potentially if, uh, as a senior. Um, currently, students would need to double up in order to take three AP science classes. And in addition, the pathway also would offer um, AP Bio and AP Chem before senior year, which is appealing to many students and families. Um, lastly, uh, there's a pathway for students to take all four AP Science classes that we offer at Acton Boxborough, uh, the fourth being AP Environmental Science, um, which is which will be offered for juniors and seniors. Um, and, and I don't believe that there are any students or there are very few um, that, that have taken all four AP Science classes. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Peter. Sorry, I'm working on it. Now, but it's now, uh, <laughs> got a lag. Okay. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Um, the second goal was to create a science sequence that um, ensures all students take a course in environmental science. And so um, we have currently in our current system about 25% of our students um, don't have a, a, a full year course um, that that um, involves environmental science. Next, please. Um, and I think we can make this argument. And certainly this is the belief of the department um, that environmental science could be, you know, potentially the most impactful science um, for, for this generation of students. Um, next slide, please. Um, and that, that environmental science, if we look at it, and there's many different ways to examine environmental science, but, um, you know, it really cuts across many fields, um, not just the hard science piece, but economics, finance, public health, and medicine, um, just to mention a few. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so part of the rationale as well, if we have all of our ninth graders taking a course in environmental earth science, um, again, this supports their transition to the high school. Students will be with grade level peers. It shifts the decision-making process from eighth to ninth grade to ninth and 10th and creates a safety net for students that does not currently exist. So the next slide, you'll see um, what the sequence looks like, uh, a four-year sequence. So we can see that our ninth grade students would take environmental earth science. 10th grade have the option for biology or AP bio. 11th grade chemistry or AP chemistry, uh, AP environmental science is also offered. Um, 12th grade physics and AP physics. Um, we have physical science, which is a course that's a, designed to be a bit of a bridge between biology and chemistry and physics for, for students. Um, and then we have semester electives. Um, and then you'll notice down on the bottom uh, there are two courses there, uh, Exploration and Visual Arts and Science. Uh, this is a course that we started last year. This is the second year of it, um, where students are working on independent, um, independently guided uh, research projects in various fields um, and exploring the, the um, expression of the data um, in visually pleasing ways. Um, and often uh, students are, are reflecting on that expression, and so sometimes those reflections can be um, socially uh, involving social justice and, and, and more uh, socially based. Um, the other course there, and so we'd like to expand that course um, nine through 12. Uh, and the other course that is there is science research for publication. Um, currently our AP bio course has a, a very robust um, uh, uh, laboratory experience. Um, we will continue that laboratory experience in 10th grade, but um, certainly when we're teaching this course as a first year course, um, we have to look at, at making some uh, modifications that are uh, age appropriate. Um, and especially since currently our students already have taken bio and many students have already taken chemistry and AP bio, um, we felt that there was a really, it was a really valuable part of the course and we wanted to um, extend that opportunity for students to continue to 
look at scientific research. And so between these two classes, this gives students an in-house uh, opportunity, 9 through 12, to explore scientific research that doesn't currently exist. Um, and I know many students uh, are, are looking for those opportunities, and, and I'm excited that we're going to be able to offer these um, in-house. I should say that explorations in visual arts and science is not a requirement for science research and publication, um, and that both of those courses are, we're expecting to offer those as full year courses, alternate day. Um, and so coming into ninth grade, our students would take earth and environmental science or environmental earth science um, and have the option to take explorations in visual arts and science as well. Next slide, please. And so that is the end of my presentation and I'm open to responding to questions. Thank you very much for, again for the opportunity. Thanks, David. Uh, before I go to questions, Peter, do you want to promote uh, Joni Dean up as well as a panelist? As long as I can find her. Yeah, she's got her hand raised. I've got it. Oh. <laughs> all right, I've just done that. Um, all right, so I see uh, Amy has her hand up in real life. Tessa has her hand up digitally. Amy's I saw first, so we'll go with Amy and then Tessa. Thanks. I, I really love this presentation. I love I love what the science department is doing. It never really made sense to me that um, a certain portion of students could just not take earth science. Um, so I felt it kind of diminished the course. So this is great. Um, I have a question about the AP courses. Mm -hmm. So um, are the AP courses going to be open to anyone that wants to take an AP class, or is it going to be based on some the previous grade? Um, because there isn't really kind of anything previous to biology. Earth science is going to be different than biology, and biology is different than chemistry, and yeah. so forth. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, I mean, I think that's one of the challenging pieces in science, um, in that the the content is so different from year to year that often it's very difficult to get a sense of where students are or where they're going to be in, in four or six months time. Um, the plan is to have those courses open and available for students. Um, and that, you know, that would be a conversation with the teacher. Um, the intention is certainly to uh, expose more students and give more students the opportunity to pursue um, advanced coursework, which would be in, in our case, those AP level classes. Um, and I really feel good about the uh, option for students that if they're stretching to take an AP course, let's say AP biology, um, and it's just proving to be too much conceptually or, or for whatever reasons, um, that there's a non-AP course for students to take in that year. Um, and we will do our best to align those to make that easy for students to, to make that transition. Um, and then also have the opportunity the next year or the year after to try the AP course again. Um, so I think that really offers students, and this is the safety net that I was referring to, um, you know, a way to stretch academically in a way that is, is um, you know, safe, so to speak, um, that really helps to support students in the best ways that we can. I, I just want to say thank you. That, 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 thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, I think it's just really important. We're focused on equity just to, I mean, really give students and families to the opportunity to make that decision and not have to, you know, it's struggle to get to the place where you're accepted to be, to be able to take it. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Tessa. Um, I just wanted to applaud this decision because having had two children now that are exceptional at science and not so much at math, I know we uncoupled math from science a few years ago in name, but I don't really think we've done it in practice because I don't think I know a single kid who took honors biology that wasn't also in algebra in eighth grade. So, um, you know, I thought that was really unfortunate. I think setting the kids up in two tracks to begin with in mostly because of math, even though we uncoupled it, um, this is, this is just really a nice way to, as you say, provide equity for kids who may be later starters, you know, who may, um, not be ready to take those advanced courses like out of the gate going into a brand new school. And, um, you know, I think it really gives hope to kids who are who are really good at science but might not be as strong in math or that may not be, you know, because they're, they're two different disciplines. And, yes, sure, science involves some math, you know, um, 
I understand, you know, physics not coming until you're taking, you know, calculus. I, I yeah. went through maybe. So I, I know all of those things, but you know, there are kids who aren't going to take physics and that's, and that's fine, you know, cause they're not going to take calculus, but I, I just, I really applaud this because I hear um, lots of chatter about this being unfair to students, but it's been unfair to students who weren't good at math for a really, really long time. I never understood when we had two separate tracks, why, there wasn't an option if you just preferred biology to take AE biology or CP biology instead of taking earth science. It was just like, you're not smart enough to take biology. So we're going to put you in earth science. And I think that's a really unfortunate um, reputation for earth science to have because, you know, environmental science, as you, as you noted, is probably one of the most important sciences going forward. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Tessa. Actually, I just want to, if I can just piggyback on a couple of things that you you, you noted there. Um, one is that uh, our um, course we've changed over the last few years. We've shifted from straight earth science to add a lot more environmental science uh, into the course. Um, and we are continuing to do that. Um, and also at, with regards to um, what that course might look like uh, next year, um, in terms of content, you know, we're, we're going to have a different population of students than we currently have. And so that course is going to evolve and grow. And, and I'm very confident that we're going to be able to provide a robust um, environmental earth science course for all of our students uh, that are coming in next year. So um, thank you for those comments. John. I had one quick question and then uh, a comment. The, the quick question is, with respect to the you know traditional CPAE honors levels, will those still exist in physics, chemistry, biology? I pass that over. I'm so glad that you asked that question. Thank you. Um, we are actually going to be offering um, uh, two levels next year uh, in earth and environmental science. Um, so we haven't quite landed on on what the names are going to be, but in in our current model, it would be like honors and. Um, either environmental earth science or CP environmental earth science. We're still working out exactly how we're going to put those pieces together. Um, and then as our, as this group, our class of 20 to 26, um, as they continue through their progression in uh, high school um, in science, we're going to continue to offer those two levels throughout uh, high school. Um, this year we have collapsed our, or incorporated, I should say, is probably a better way to phrase it, um, our CP1 class into our college prep biology. Um, and we will do that again uh, in the fall for our uh, college prep um, earth, environmental earth science as well. Okay. And then um, for my comment, um, you know, as usual, I have a little bit different view of <laughs> a couple of things. So I've been doing science for, um, you know, 50 years now. And there are things that I work on that, you know, I had formal academic background in. And, you know, the reality is most of the things that I've worked on, I, I had no academic background in. So I, you know, as somebody who loves science, actually, you know, am pretty cavalier about which particular courses anybody chooses to take. Um, that, you know, if people learn good critical thinking skills, if they understand, you know, what the design of an experiment is, um, they're learning what they need to learn. And, you know, biology, chemistry, don't care, don't think that it makes a huge difference. Um, the other comment that I would make is, you know, it would be great, you know, if all students were actually somewhat similar and therefore, you know, a similar course progression could serve them equally well. The reality, of course, is that students are all different. Um, and, you know, in my view, to the extent that it's possible, the more different paths that are enabled by what we offer, the better off students are. So while I understand the argument about allowing some time for cognitive development, you know, there are some horses that are ready to, you know, leap out of the gate and a system which allows them to do that in some way, in my view, is, is a better system. Um, you know, and I always you know, use the example because it's my personal example that I learned to read, you know, sort of in the middle of the second grade. It wasn't probably so much fun for my first grade teacher, you know, <laughs> that I didn't know how to read, but it worked out fine. You know, it came, you know, at a time that, you know, there it was recovery. So the other part of the plan, you know, that I think is good, you know, is on the one hand, 
to provide students with opportunities, you know, to try harder things. But, you know, that there are always some, you know, fallback so that if that doesn't work out, there's a way um, so that there, there can be, you know, a relatively soft landing. But having said that, you know, sometimes there is great learning in hard failure. So, I, again, you know, you need to be a little cautious about what you want to do. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, you know, to your point, you know, to say that sometimes the content doesn't matter as much. Um, you know, when we're looking at developing uh, student thinking skills and certainly in, in relation to science, um, you know, we'd like to think that we offer that opportunity for all of our students, regardless of what, what course they're taking or content they're taking. Um, you know, there are those threads in terms of um, experimental design and data analysis and error analysis and so forth um, that really run throughout all of our classes. And, and so I appreciate you, you bringing that up um, for us. Thank you. Thanks. Any other comments from members of the committee? Okay, um, I see two people with their hands raised uh, in the attendee list. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, people who wish to make a comment right now are making a comment on this item, the, the high school science course. Um, if you missed the opportunity to make a comment in public participation, if it maybe relates to a, a staffing cut or something in the budget, that would be another good opportunity to make that comment. Um, so if you have a comment that you wish to make regarding the high school science course overview, um, please raise your hand and I will call on you. All right, uh, Prem, go ahead. Thank you, Wes, thank you. This was a very interesting conversation. I just had a couple of thoughts. So in general, I believe that whenever we reduce the flexibility and options for people, I think it's not good because we're literally trying to force everybody into the same path. And that is what, I, in, what I'm seeing from an environmental science perspective. Over the years, I've seen gradually AB is lowering the standard of the education. And in the and, and we always paint a rosy picture that, hey, we are making it more equitable. I understand all that. We want things to be equitable, but life is not equitable at every point, right? So if there are people who want to take a different course, different pathway, I don't think we should prevent that from happening by forcing everybody to take environmental science. And the second thing which was not clear to me is in the, in the 10th grade, can people take AP biology directly or do they have to take biology and then try and do AP biology, physics, chemistry in the next three years? So that way, essentially it means you have to take two science blocks in one year if your goal was to finish all the three APs. Thank you. Prem, thank you for your question. Um, so so uh, the, the, the model that we're proposing is students can go straight into AP Bio in 10th grade um, and can do AP Bio in the first year. So they don't need to do a non-AP Biology course first. Um, so they would be able to do 10th grade AP Biology, 11th grade AP Chemistry, uh, 12th grade AP Physics if, if the student is inclined to do those things. Um, so they can go right into that. Um, and, and, and one thing I do just want to say, too, I mean, I've been doing this job a long time and educating students. It's changed a lot over the years. Um, you know, we, we often, um, certainly when I was in school, you know, there's a lot of, we had to learn stuff, right? We had to learn facts. We had to learn things. And, and you know, with students, at their, with all of that information at their fingertips, you know, we're really working on application and, and developing critical thinking skills um, and, and how those concepts and how that information is, is linked together. And so um, I think for me, at least anyway, just as we're starting, as we're thinking about the students that are in front of us and teaching our current population of students, we have to keep that in mind, um, you know, that what they're expected to do and, and the way that they're learning is different than, than my own experience um, and certainly the way that it was 10 years ago and 20 years ago. Um, and and it's, it's really uh, exciting to see our students growing and changing that way and to see our staff adjusting um, and trying to meet the needs of our students that are in front of us as well. Okay, uh, I will go, uh, we've got two people with their hands raised still, so we'll go through those two and then we're going to move on. Uh, so first is Rabbi Mike, did you have a comment about the science curriculum? So I don't, I, I didn't realize that you had to register and raise your hand for the, for the public comment. So I'd love right. to be able to speak, but um, 
my friend David has done such a good job. I don't want to take any from any attention away from him. So how do you want to work that? Um, I, I think I'd like to wait till we get to the budget discussion. I, I think your your comment may be germane to that topic as well. So why don't we save it for then, and I'll I'll call on you then. Is that okay? Okay, that works. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and Corinne, is that here? All right, Corinne, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted. Did you say, Mr. Baumreiter, that the it'll go from three tracks to two? For, you know, I mean, like it'll only be you know honors or something else, or there's still going to be three levels. Um, yeah. So, so um, for the environmental earth science, we're going to run two levels, um, mm -hmm. and then uh, that when the class of 2026 becomes into their sophomore year, we'll have the AP course, and then we'll have two additional levels. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. So, and, so and far, I, go ahead. Go ahead, Corinne. No, no. Go ahead. I just would say so that earth science would be kind of like. Um, freshman on freshman English. So you're either in English or you're in honors English. And then the, the English class was unweighted. Correct. My understanding is it'll be, be more like my, like the English, um, the way that that's run. Um, okay. you know, and I, I also want to just point out too, that, you know, we don't view, at least in our view here anyway, that we're not viewing the, the levels necessarily as tracks. It's just where students are at a given point in time. Yeah. Um, and you know, that students have flexibility to move between the levels. And is um, honors physics still going to have honors calc as a requirement to be co-registered? Yeah, it, it will. And, and the reason for that is that the um, honors physics is a calculus-based physics course, and it and it uses it legitimately uses the math that students are learning in calculus directly in the course. Um, and that's a little bit different than some of the other classes where. Um, there, there is some math and there's some some calculations and, and quantitative analysis, um, but that is a specific use of those okay. uh, specific will, skills. Um, will honors calc specifically be a requirement, or what about AE, you know AE calc? Um, so the way that we have it is that it's um, that students need to be concurrently enrolled in uh, AB or BC calculus. Okay. Okay, and we and there 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 are um, we don't currently run the course and. and I'm not making any promises about anything, but we are potent, you know, there is potential to look at some other alternatives for non AP, uh, excuse me, for non calculus based uh, AP physics courses. So that may be something on the horizon for us to look at as well. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, last one, uh, Leah Abraham. Go ahead and unmute. Yes. So I wanted to add the thought that. Not every student is inspired by the same course material. I, I've seen in my three children, they love their biology units much more than they love their earth science units. And I think reducing flexibility for parents and students to choose which material we're using to teach them the data collection and the report processing and the lab techniques runs the chance of having students be less inspired by their classes and less likely to want to continue with more science. Thank you, Leah. I appreciate your comments. Um, you know, I'd certainly like to think that, that you know, for, for every student that may feel that way, that, that um, you know, taking certain courses can also expand students' minds and thinking that sometimes they go into classes feeling like it's not something that they're as interested in. Um, and the more they learn, uh, the, that they really learn to appreciate um, that course. Um, you know, and we can also look at this in terms of a, a progression of science skills uh, over time as well. So um, I do appreciate your comments. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, David and Joni, for, for joining us this evening and uh, for the great presentation. We are going to move on now to uh, the COVID protocols update. All right, so thank you very much. Um, I want to see Joanne Chadwick and Diane Spring should be in the audience here. I see Diane with her hand up. And Joanne. I feel like I'm a little out of practice on the remote. <laughs> I agree. Which is yeah. a great feeling. I just promoted one of the Dianes. Oh, and I just promoted another Diane, so I think. Oh. 
How are we doing? This is the the this is the real Diane. <laughs> Welcome, Diane. Uh, we're just looking for Joanne before we get started. Don, do you mind just? Oh, I think I found her. Here we go. Success. All right. Um, so um, I am just going to to introduce um, a couple of our nurse leaders here. Um, we have Diane Spring with us and Joanne Chadwick. Um, Diane and Joanne are two of our nurse leaders in our district. Um, I have to say there was absolutely no way we would be getting through the pandemic without them, along with all of our nursing staff. Um, you know, I think prior to a pandemic, the nurses were people that everyone knew had in school and there were some students with medical issues or sometimes students would be injured. And, you know, there'd be a lot of interaction with the nurse and a lot of leadership in those situations out of nurses. But um, I think all of our nurses have demonstrated just a, such an exceptional level of leadership um, in all of our schools throughout the pandemic, um, not only in responding to things, but also really helping people understand what they're hearing, um, how to decode some of that information, and then put it into practice and really just establish a, a sense of, you know, psychological safety as well as health um, within our schools. So thank you to Joanne and Diane for joining us. Um, Don has been working with the nurses extensively through the pandemic. And I just want to recognize all the work that she's done uh, with that group as well. Um, the three of them, along with Marie and I, um, are members on what we call our district's health advisory team. Uh, and we meet, have met every week since the start of the pandemic uh, with another group of individuals that includes the Cheryl Ball from the town of Acton Health Department. She's the health director for Acton. Um, Heather York is the town nurse for Acton. Um, Jim Gareffi is the um, with the Neshoba Board of Health that serves Boxborough, uh, meets with us every week. And then Jasmine Darling is our school physician um, at, with Acton Medical Associates. And we meet every week. Um, sometimes we have guests that join us at times, but that's really the core group that's been meeting throughout the pandemic. And we rely on them so much in terms of developing protocols, their judgment, their understanding of what's going on in the medical and you know public health worlds and helping us to translate that into practice. So. Um, I just want to give a shout out to that group because they have been absolutely instrumental in helping us navigate this pandemic. So I'm going to start out the presentation. Don, feel free to jump in at any point as well. Um, and, you know, about halfway through, we're going to turn it over to our nurse leaders um, so they can kind of take us through this, the second piece of this. So, um, you know, I think we always want to come back to this, but we, throughout the pandemic, we've really established early core health principles. And the primary message I want to deliver here is that there wasn't any one principle of things that we were doing that we thought could solve the problem. Um, it's really a combination of different things that we do at different times that help us to reduce risk. Uh, we are not in a risk-free environment. We will never be in a risk-free environment. Uh, we weren't before the pandemic. We certainly haven't been for two years, and I don't think we will be coming out of the pandemic as we go into endemic stage at some point. But, you know, it's really about being committed to a series of protocols um, and principles that allow us to reduce risk for everyone. On a bright note, vaccination data. Um, I want to just start with this about the importance of vaccination and why it's just so important for people to be vaccinated. I don't know how many of you read the New York Times, but this was um, in, I believe it was yesterday's Times, or maybe even a day before um, I start to lose track of days. Um, but these were some charts that they published looking at New York City and the Seattle area about not only the case counts between vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals, um, but also looking at uh, outcomes um, and hospitalizations. And it's not even, you know, it, it goes much deeper than this because I think what I've also read recently is that hospitalizations, 
the duration of hospitalizations is significantly lower for vaccinated individuals than unvaccinated individuals. Um, I didn't get into deaths in here, but it's a similar trend pattern. So really vaccination is just such a critical critical measure, um, not only in terms of trying to reduce our case counts, um, we know it's not fail safe, but certainly in terms of reducing and improving outcomes for people. Our vaccination rates across the district right now are very strong. Um, we are averaging overall 83% um, of our students. You'll note the pre-K numbers. This is the percentage of eligible fifth graders. There are more students in pre-K than this, so the actual percentage is much lower of uh, total vaccinated students in the pre-K. This is just eligible fifth graders. Um, you know, one thing I'll note, if you have read the Boston Globe recently, you saw the headline um, that they're struggling in trying to determine whether or not they can stay open. Um, I think, interestingly, Charlie Baker also shared the elementary vaccination rate is really lagging across the state. I think the statewide average for elementary age students right now is about 35 percent. I think Boston's hovering around 30 percent. Uh, we're up near 80 percent. Um, and so as we think about the protocols that we have in place, we need to also think about protocols that reflect the vaccination rate and make sure that the measures we take are responsive to the vaccination rate that we have. Mitigation, I'm not going to go through all of these. These have been ongoing mitigation strategies. You've seen this slide before. Um, we've shared this multiple times throughout the pandemic. But as I said on the first slide, there really is a series of, of different mitigation strategies that we have in place. These continue to be with us to this day. Um, additionally, uh, we have put in some additional measures as we return from the winter break. Uh, we have asked all of our staff to go back to arranging desks in rows um, that are three feet or so to the extent feasible. We know not every classroom in the district can get to three feet. Um, that's a limitation we have. We also know we do have some furniture limitations now that all students are back. It's, we do have tables in some classrooms, um, but all of our staff have taken some measures to increase distancing in the classrooms and get as close to the standard as possible. Um, you heard that from our high school students earlier, um, that there's a little bit more restrictive than what they were used to earlier in the year. We've also looked at removing unnecessary furniture from offices and meeting rooms. We continue to keep our locker rooms closed. That's consistent with the um, requirement from the Act and Board of Health. We have increased signage and markings in common areas, and we have also gone to virtual meetings, um, and we are limiting um, guests at some of our events, including athletic events. We met with our staff as we were returning from break and we stressed a, a number of different things and really asked them to recommit to these. One, ensuring adequate airflow, uh, making sure that our air purifiers were functioning on a daily basis. They were on and operating at high settings. Windows were open. Yes, it's winter and it's also cold. We know that, um, but we, this is something that we need to do. We're looking at ways that we can minimize congestion in traffic areas. That's not always possible, but to the extent it is, we do that reducing interactions between student cohorts. Um, we had prior to the Omicron variant uh, been allowing more interactions between multiple grades at elementary schools, things like book buddies. You might have a fifth grade class working with a kindergarten class. We're actually putting that on pause for right now, um, but we'll be resuming that as soon as possible. We have looked again at our cafeteria seating um, and to the extent possible, looking at um, space in the CAFs and trying to keep students spread out. Um, the high school has tried to add additional seating in other areas of the building uh, to allow students choices in terms of what they're doing at lunchtime. Uh, making sure that during uh, mask breaks, particularly at snack time, that students who have masks removed are sitting six feet apart and then really stressing regular schedules um, for students for washing and sanitizing. This is an area that um, not all people in our community have been very happy with, but we received new guidance um, from the Department of Education and Mass Massachusetts uh, Department of Public Health. Uh, they looked at the new CDC guidance around isolation times that came out uh, right at the end of December. And the guidance that DPH and DESE have given to schools is that the isolation time is now reduced from 10 days to five days. Um, we do say that symptoms must be fully resolved if you look at our flow charts and people should be fever free for 24 hours without medication. Um, and when people come back, they must remain masked when they're around others for five additional days. Um, we have the revised flowcharts on our website. I did include some language because we do get questions from people 
around what happens at lunch. Um, and the uh, ask of Desi for lunch times is that it's very, very similar to what we've been doing throughout the entire year with students who are in our test and stay program, uh, where during meals, the mask should only be removed when they're actively eating. Desi also recommends a physical distance of at least three feet when eating. Um, and so that is the guidance that we work off of from the state uh, regarding that. And I know, you know, I recognize that not everyone's comfortable with that. Um, unfortunately, I think part of the DESI guidance was what can keep schools operational um, and what's feasible in schools and also trying to keep people as safe as possible in those schools. Talk a little bit about staffing challenges that we've seen, um, particularly in the surge. Here are a couple charts of our uh, absentee rates over the last couple of weeks. Um, you can see that the week coming back from vacation was particularly challenging. Uh, that first week back from vacation, we were actually averaging just about 120 plus staff members absent every day. Um, and that has started to improve as we've gone through this week. Please remember, last Friday was a snow day. I'm not sure who was putting in for absences. I'm sorry about that, but um, hopefully you didn't lose a sick day over it. Um, and then in addition, um, this Friday, you know, we really don't know. It says 5%, but we haven't gotten to the morning yet uh, when people typically report in. So we don't want to put too much credence in the two Fridays. That only tells about half the picture of staffing challenges. The, what you're looking at for a chart, we call it the weekly fill rate. Fill rate is the percentage of people who require subs where we can actually get a sub. So what you can see from these charts is we're generally falling between 10 and 35% of our staff members who require subs are not getting them, um, which is a real challenge for us. We, over the last few weeks, um, and this goes right back to before break, um, have really gotten to a point where we don't know what we're getting for staffing on a given day. Um, teachers are trying to cover for each other. Uh, people are covering each other's classrooms. We're you know, just trying to find staff members to put in front of students. We obviously have to prioritize the elementary level um, from a supervision standpoint. There have been times when high school classes have to be canceled and students might end up with another free period. Um, because of that, it's just an operational challenge that we have. Um, unfortunately, there is just no workforce for substitute teachers and people are not working right now. And sometimes even our substitutes and nurses get sick um, and that can provide an additional challenge, particularly in the area of nursing. If one of our school nurses falls sick, we have zero nurse substitutes right now. Um, fortunately, and I said this before, but uh, Diane and Joanne um, have just done so many different things for us this year, but they will typically run over and try and cover for a, a nurse that's out for a day. Some other significant challenges we've seen, um, new COVID infections are the number one challenge that we see. Uh, we have had in the last month, 715 new cases in the district. Um, I wanted to put that together for you because it's a striking number. Um, that is absolutely parallel with what we're seeing nationally and at the state level with the spread of Omicron. Um, weekly details for each school are published in our COVID dashboard. The one thing I always caution people about if they email me or call me about, um, usually it's about a concern with the number of high school cases, uh, scale matters. Um, you know, our high school has 1,750 students and our elementary schools might have 350 students. And if you're comparing apples to apples, you have to really make sure you're multiplying what you see at an elementary school by five in order to understand how many cases you might see at a high school. So if you see, you know, four cases at an elementary school on a given day, that would be the same as a high school seeing 20 cases. Um, it's particularly challenging for staff at the high school to be able to manage that number of cases, but in terms of the number of students, that's roughly equivalent. Um, Joanne, do you want to jump in here and talk a little about contact tracing and some of what you see in that process? Sure, sure. And I'd just like to, to add that, you know, um, on behalf of the nurses, we've, you know, we're very grateful to working with everybody everybody's been incredibly supportive. And I have to say the nurses have been incredible, amazing group of professionals who, um, you know, we keep, we try to keep very up to date um, and evolve as the situation evolves. So it's, it's a pleasure working with that group of people. So thank you. So contact tracing has been um, in becoming incredibly challenging for us. Um, we, we literally um, have hundreds of contact tracing to do, and we are trying to stay in line with the board of health and they are also, um, their situation is evolving. They're trying to 
step back from contact tracing a little, trying to be more um, focused on cluster groups, which is what we're also doing um, in the school. It's it's we're not finding it effective. Um, we're, we're having to notify so many people that families are becoming bombarded. And we actually have always found that the actual school spread within the classroom itself is quite low. Um, most of the, of the contact is going on outside of the school or in a social situation or in family groups. And um, it's just not, it's not working anymore. And it's, uh, I think what we've said is at the moment in this current surge, you have to consider yourself to be a close contact all the time because it, it is everywhere in the community. It's, it's all around. And um, so this is not a strategy that's um, particularly useful for us as the situation has evolved. At the next slide. Yeah, you know, one thing I would add, um, I think at the high school level, um, you know, we went to a classroom-wide notification system because we recognize it was there and just spreading so fast. Um, at the high school level, in one week, that actually generated over 2,500 emails to families um, because each student is taking seven classes. Um, and at that point, you know, I mean, people are receiving five, six, seven, eight, nine emails a day. Um, and it's actually not even helpful at that point because it's, it, it, people stop actually paying attention to what they need to. Yeah. So um, most of nursing time has been taken up with um, the testing efforts, which we have been doing pool testing. Now, we've only been doing pool testing in ele elementary level schools um, this year. And the reason for that is it's pool testing is only recommended for a non-vaccinated population. And that's uh, widely reported in the literature and also supported by DESI. So we have, um, the elementary schools have been doing pool testing and we've administered, as you see, a huge number of um, tests, 6,300 um, tests administered. These tests are done Monday through uh, Wednesday in our elementary schools. And then what happens is the results come back and then if a pool is positive, uh, we then do testing on those between uh, five and 10 members of the pool to see who the positive case is or if there's more than one positive. So we have to individually test those members of the pool. The other test that um, we're talking about here is our, from our test and stay program. When people have unvaccinated individuals have been uh, uh, deemed as close contacts. So we test, test the children to allow them to come to school for the next five days. And then symptomatic testing when children have presented in the health offices sick we now have the ability to do um, a rapid by next test. And I think we've got more slides to show that. So the problem with pool testing is it was a very good tool that we used when the uh, prevalence of disease was low in the community. So uh, less than 5% um, positivity rate, but we're now running closer to a 20, 25% positivity rate, um, which really means in, in terms um, one in four people in the community at this point are testing positive for COVID. And I do talk to Board of Health most days. Now, that's, that rate comes from uh, tests that have gone through labs and been registered. If you think about the number of people who are testing at home and not registering, you know, just a home test that you don't record, it's probably thought that that, that rate is probably closer to 50%. So one in two of us at the moment have COVID, which is quite incredible. So what's happening is we're getting an incredible amount of pools coming back positive. Um, when they come back positive, we then have to test all those individuals. But the problem is, um, because we have a high number of vaccinated children in, in those pools now, um, we're getting a lot of, uh, we're finding it very difficult to find who the positive cases are. And mo um, nearly 40% of the pools, we can't identify the individual who is positive. And the reason for that is that, um, the pool is a PCR test, so it could be picking up a very old infection from two weeks ago because many children have COVID asymptomatically. And so they're actually not infectious, they're not spreading COVID, and it's triggering the pool. And also people who have um, who are vaccinated, uh, often you can get a very, a very small um, positive, uh, load that triggers a positive pool, and actually they're not shedding the virus and again, it triggers a pool that's positive that, you know, doesn't really need any action. So that's what's happening. The pools are not uh, giving us any uh, useful information, creating an incredible amount of work. 
Um, they're also a snapshot in time. We found that Omicron moves so quickly. Uh, we do a pool on a Wednesday. A child could leave the health office after having the pool testing done. Uh, Wednesday afternoon, go out. You know, they'll be symptomatic within two to three days. And so, you know, the pool isn't really giving us, I don't, I, we feel like it's not providing any safety for us. Um, it's not the way to go forward with what we're seeing now. That's also backed up by uh, Desi, who have always said um, vaccinated individuals should not be in pools. It's just not a good way of keeping surveillance on the disease. Um, test and stay, that's what we've done. When uh, pools have come back positive and we've identified close contacts who are unvaccinated, we've allowed them to, rather than keeping them out of school, which we know is not a good thing, we have um, had them coming into school and tested them every every morning in the health office. It's, it worked, as, as I said, um, in the early days when uh, we had low disease um, levels. But what's happening now is we're not actually finding that these children who are close contacts are actually um, converting to positive. So that made us feel like what we're seeing in the classroom contact is not spreading. COVID as much as outside school. And if you if you're a close contact outside school, you're not actually, uh, you can't go into this program. So again, we don't feel like this is a good use of our time. And I mean, at some points in the last, um, last month, we were doing over 80 tests and stays every single day in health offices. And that's on top of a normal nurse, school nurse workload. So, you know, it was taking uh, nurse time away from everything else that the school nurses are supposed to do and yielding very, very low um conversion rates, one or two. I mean, it's it was just a huge amount of work for a very small return. So well, I'll, I'll jump in. Oh, go ahead. I was no, just going to no, say, carry on, carry on. just as an overall, I think, um, you know, one of the things that we need to think about, um, we certainly want to try and do everything. And I know our community certainly wants us to try and do everything. Um, but there is a reality uh, that we do have limited staff, we don't have unlimited time, and we don't have unlimited resources. And one of the things I think that's really important is that, you know, a lot of times things that have kept us feeling safe in the past, um, we have to sometimes think about how to move on from those because they may not actually be the tools that are effective based on what we're currently seeing. And so the thinking that we did with our um, health advisory team, and I mentioned the, the entire makeup of that before, we've spent multiple meetings talking about all of these topics. And what we really came to is we need to think about what we're seeing currently with the virus. And we need to think about focusing our efforts, which include our staff, our time and resources on strategies that we actually believe will have a great positive impact on mitigating spread. Um, and so we're going to talk about several changes that you're going to see. I'll turn it back over to Diane in a minute to talk about those. Uh, oh, excuse me, Joanne, sorry. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, we do want to significantly increase rapid antigen testing of symptomatic individuals. You are likely hearing about this all over the news. Um, I'll let Joanne talk to it in a minute about why, but th we believe that is going to be the critical uh, mitigation factor that we can use from a testing standpoint. Um, we do not have an effective pooled testing program. We'll talk a little bit about that. And so our plan is to end pooled testing. Um, this will be the last week. And as of next Monday, we will no longer be doing pooled testing. Um, and then also in terms of contact tracing efforts, we have to curtail the widespread contact tracing efforts and instead think about becoming more focused with what we're trying to do. So I'll turn it over to Joanne to talk a little bit about each of those. So we are actually, I mean, we feel very positive about this as a good way to keep um, staff and children safe as we can. Um, it's using the, the, the rapid antigen testing and symptomatic testing. And I think this is certainly the best way to go forward. So um, because often when we, when we um, reflex out, test out the pools, um, sometimes we find um, it's, it, pools are being triggered by could be old infections but what we know is that when kids are symptomatic that's when they're spreading the virus most readily and so what we decided to do is if we test children who are have symptoms and again we are not we are not advocating that children come to school sick if your child is sick even with mild symptoms they should stay home but you know if, 
if children don't feel well while they're in school, um, we would we have the ability to do testing. And um, we feel like that's that's definitely the way to go. And we're also, you know, we are using professional judgment, looking at the symptom list that came down from DESI, because we are aware that things have changed as the virus has evolved. Uh, Omicron, thankfully, is showing up with far more mild symptoms. But um, using judgment to test children who just maybe have a headache, runny nose, slight sore throat, things like that. As I say, we don't want kids coming to school sick, but... You know, during the day they don't feel well. Uh, we feel like doing symptomatic testing is the way to go because then we can do the test straight away. We have a result within a 15 minutes and then we can send that, that person home and um, ask them about close contacts and, you know, in, give information in a much more, um, a, a far quicker way to the family. So that seems to be the definitely what we want to do. And um, for example, this week we saw... We saw that with a couple of children coming into health offices who didn't feel well. We tested them, they were positive. And yet they'd been in pools and that hadn't shown anything two days before. So it just speaks to the fact that this is a much better way where we are in the pandemic now as it becomes endemic, that we can um, we can keep people safe. Yeah, and I think, you know, the other thing I'll mention here, um, we have placed an order as a district to... Um, Purchase. We're actually teaming up with another local district um, to purchase a whole pallet of rapid antigen tests um, for our staff. And then the town of Acton um, let us know that they're actually working on a grant program that would be able to allow us to actually hand out um, rapid antigen tests to our students for home use as well. Um, so we're hoping to see those in in the next week to two weeks, maybe three weeks, depending on the supply chain. Um, but we are, in addition to working in our school health offices, we're also trying to figure out how we can provide these um, in people's homes. Okay, so. so yeah, go ahead, Joanne. That was yeah, just, I was say, yeah, I, mean, I mean, it's just, um, I mean, from we, we try as a professional group to um, stay very up to date with the science and um, follow the science. And I think. For that reason, it's very clear, also in collaboration with the boards of health and um, the school physician, it's it's very clear that the pool testing is no longer an effective strategy. Um, definitely moving towards symptomatic testing, uh, keep encouraging vaccination, um, and uh, you know the mitigation other mitigation strategies we have in place with the um, that we've always had. You know the hygiene, the um, the the uh, the filters in the classrooms. And I think that's that's definitely the best way we can go uh, with um, and possibly, you know, if we can get tests with people to have at home, that's how we're going to manage this going forward. I really feel like that's um, that's the way to go. And it's a more sensible approach now. Um, we will continue. We're not going to do mass uh, contact tracing because as I said, it's not really yielding any results and it's not really been very helpful to people, especially as we're not going to be, um, we're not going to be offering the test and stay program. It's just, we'll let you know you will be able to come to school unless you are unwell or you test positive. And um, then you will follow the isolation guidelines. Uh, it's, it's clear that, you know, people vaccinated and unvaccinated can get COVID, but we know the outcomes are much better. People are less sick if you've been vaccinated, so we thoroughly encourage that. And, um, you know, we, we maintain the data on the district website. And I think it's really important that everybody knows that as a professional group, we we watch the situation evolve. If we need to change tack, we will. We, you know, we we don't, um, we, we keep up to date with what needs to be done. And I think that's great that um, the district has, has continually tried to keep up. And I think we've... Um, We've been at the forefront of um, keeping people safe. I think we've done a pretty good job considering the numbers have been so high. Yeah, and I think, you know, we talk about curtailing contact tracing. You know, I think we've now contact traced, you know, we're, we're starting to come up on our thousandth, you know, positive case. Um, probably within another week or so, we'll, we'll be getting the thousandth case in the district. And I think, you know, through that, the professionals who are doing this work have developed a real sense of judgment around where the cases um, are in higher risk environments and where they're not. 
Um, so, you know, one example of a higher risk environment is an athletic team. Um, it's not because the students are doing anything wrong and our athletes are actually being extremely cautious because they want their seasons to continue. Um, but, you know, playing, you know, a sport can be a higher risk environment for transmission. Um, in addition, as we start, we are going to continue to monitor our cases. Um, and if we start to see anything that we could become concerned about, we can always look at contract tracing, various scenarios. Um, and we expect that we'll be continuing to do that as well. Um, but I think it's it's really the combination of curtailing some of these things that aren't working right now and, and aren't working in this new environment so that we can focus on something that allows us to be more um, proactive in, in trying to mitigate spread. So, you know, I just want to thank you for listening. I will... Um, you know, turn it over to you so we can take some questions, comments. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think we're in a hard spot in the pandemic because it's shifted so significantly. I think there is a silver lining to it. Um, I think we're probably, I, I saw a chart in the Boston Globe, we're probably two weeks away from where the peak is. Um, so we have a couple more really tough weeks, I think. Um, and then we are going to see Omicron start to, you know, dissipate probably at about the same rate that it came in. Um, so, you know, according to the globe, probably mid-March, it will start to really feel more like what we did prior to, to this um, variant. All right. Thank you, Peter. Joanne, uh, I, we've got questions from the committee already lined up, so we'll start with Amy, please. So I'm going to break the rules and say I don't actually have a question. I just want to say, Joanne, Diane, all of the nurses, um, what you have done over the last two years is incredible. And I am so appreciative that, you know, all of your work that you did not initially sign up for, I'm sure. Um, I just, it's, it's really important and you've gotten our kids back into school. So thank you very much. Thanks, Amy. John. I will also begin with a thank you for, you know, a very thoughtful presentation, you know, that explained you know, really large changes in our mode of operation in response to changes in our circumstances. And that's really difficult. So I'm really pleased um, both with the presentation and that you were able to do that. Um, now, I also, you know, took a look at flu, flu view uh, to see what was going on. And it looks as though we are now headed into a pretty normal flu season. So my question is, um, is twofold. One is, you know, with respect to parents who are looking at uh, children who are sick, you know, what should they do in terms of uh, differential diagnosis and treatment with respect to uh, flu versus COVID? Uh, and then the second thing is, how is that going to impact our school operations as we go forward? Diane or Joanne, do you want to talk about kind of, you know, what we're hoping for, um, for students who may be symptomatic, whether they think it might be the flu or COVID, because I think it'd be hard to discern. Joanne, you want me to speak to that? Yeah. Okay. So as far as, as flu, um, yes, as people take masks off, we're apt to see more of it. There's no doubt of that. Um, we know from in practice that flu and um, COVID can be comorbid, as we call them, that they can coexist. And up to as of late, usually the practices are um, swabbing and testing for each. Um, again, um, in the health office, if a child presents with symptoms um, that could fit either of those diagnoses. Here's another plus, right, that we can do the Binex rapid antigen right in the health office. And um, at least for that snapshot in time, and usually with a pretty active symptom picture, we should get a pretty good read on that, um, be able to tell if um, that child um, has COVID or not. And then with that, um, you know, they would be heading to the doctors depending on how ill they were and they have the capacity to do the flu swabs. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. I, I, again, get the flu vaccine as well as the COVID vaccine for the children would be our continuing 
um, mantra um, that it does protect. And um, Joanne, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. All right. Thanks, Diane. Okay. Ben. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, also, thank you both, Diane and Joanne, for your tireless work in terms of um, addressing the situation within our schools. However, I do have one question in terms of logistics. You indicated that starting on the 17th, there will be no more full testing, which is PCR testing, here in the Acton Boxborough Public Schools. And starting that day, you will be shifting more to antigen testing. One of the concerns that I have seen in other municipalities across the state is being able to get a hold of the inventory of those antigen tests to conduct those tests on our students to ensure that if kids are testing positive, that we have the necessary stock to make that determination to make sure that those kids are isolated and sent home from school. From what it sounds like right now, statewide, there is not enough tests out there. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm seeing this and hearing this from various other municipalities. I, I can take that, Peter, if you like. Um, I can reassure you at the moment, the supply is very high in the school. Um, and we've made sure we have plenty because we've had to use those tests for the um, for the test and stay program. So we actually have a, a fairly high inventory and we are, I've always kept ahead of the order. So, um, I mean, obviously we don't want to turn into a testing station where people just send kids in to get tested who are sick. I mean, that's not what we want because we don't want sick kids coming into school, but um, we're pretty, pretty well stocked. And I, I know there's more coming and I would anticipate we would get good numbers before that stock runs down. So at the moment, we're in a good place. Thank you. And the follow-up is, in terms of reporting, because the PCR tests go back to the state lab and are reported to the state, how will reporting be handled moving forward? I know okay. that we have a dashboard for PCR testing, but will there be a dashboard for the antigen testing to let our folks know in our communities yeah. uh, okay. what the infection rate is? Yes, thank you. Um, when we started all the testing, we had to, the tests come from a, um, a central place, this a CIC it's called. Um, that, that's, that's a computer program that comes with that, that all the nurses have to enter every test they do. Luckily, those tests are actually linked to the state reporting system, MAVEN, which automatically um, flags that up at the boards of health for the towns. So any test that we um, enter, um, and is positive or negative, but the positive is actually an official test. So like if you, if you had somebody who needed an official test to travel in the summer, if they still want that or undergo some sort of procedure, they will be able to get a letter for, of um, evidence of having uh, COVID from one of the tests that we've carried out in the school. So all the school nurses are able to enter those tests into the state system. I want to clarify too that the um, the dashboard is actually all tests. So it's the Binax now rapid antigen. So for test and stay, it's also the symptomatic testing. It's also the reflex testing. And now it's all the home testing as well, which is really skyrocketed, thankfully, in our community. Parents are really, really um, being very sensitive and, and real responsive. Um, and also the PCR. So um, all of those actually are not, well, the pool testing are not on our dashboard. That is the one thing that's not on the dashboard. Um, but everything else is on the dashboard. So, thank you. Thank you, uh, Jenny. Thank you. Um, I also want to say thank you to to the nurses. And um, somebody said that they didn't sign up for this, and and I want to just remind everybody that nobody working in our school district signed up for any of this. So. I appreciate our educators and staff and, um, and everybody who works in the district. Peter, for you, I just wanted to ask you about, um, this may seem a less important point, but um, the um, uh, restrictions on going, uh, viewing the various sporting events, is there um, a date that that's going to be reconsidered or is that, I mean, what is the, 
I'm sorry if I missed that, but what is the timeline for reconsidering? Because I mean, obviously everything indoor, everybody has to be masked. So um, I'm just wondering if there's an off ramp for that particular restriction. Yeah, I think, you know, we're going to probably evaluate that on a month by month basis. Um, so I think when we implemented that, we said we would revisit it at the end of January um, and determine where we were seeing cases go. Um, you know, I think, you know, my gut tells me looking at some of the projections for Omicron, we're probably looking at something through probably around February vacation. Um, you know, I think I'm a little hesitant to start putting large crowds. I think, you know, um, our students have been fantastic in school wearing masks correctly and consistently. And we heard that from our, our student reps, but I think sometimes in more social settings that can become more challenging for kids. Um, so I'm a little hesitant to open that up right now, but um, I, I really, you know, I, I think I can't stress enough that what we're doing right now is temporary um, that I, I think we're, on the back end of what most people are thinking of as the pandemic. Um, I think we've heard now in the last week, um, I think both the UK and um, Spain are starting to consider the point at which this becomes endemic and not pandemic anymore. Um, and, you know, I think we will be there at some point in the spring heading into summer. Um, our curve might just be a little bit behind them. So this is really kind of one of those, uh, we really hope people bear with us during this because we have to do some different things right now, but it, it, it will get better. Andrew. Thanks. Um, it, this is a terrible time. Thank you, as many have said, for your diligence and all of it. I'm reminded I have a friend who, when people had landlines, refused to pay for call waiting. And he said to me, why would I want that? No one ever tries to call me when I'm on the phone. I stared at him for a minute. He's saying, how would you know? Kids who get COVID are 2.5 times more likely to receive a diabetes diagnosis per that study that was released last week from the CDC. Long COVID is still this cloud of misunderstanding. I have family members right now who are positive, extended family who are positive, relatives who can't taste anything, and friends and family have died. We've been battling this thing for two years, and we knew that this month was going to be difficult. We knew that after the spike from Halloween and the spike from Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's were going to be even worse. We didn't know that this new variant was going to be in so much, so much more contagious. We didn't know what was going to happen with the next variant. For a long time, I thought that there was a bias against pulling kids from school because we wanted to keep our parents working. But now offices, conferences, municipal meetings are all being pulled back, and Desi is adamantly against any remote options. And this week, every day my family's received a close contact or a class contact notification. The town has made policies stating that we are seeing more positives that are being reported by the Board of Health, by the district's data site. This is everywhere, and the discussion isn't about containment. And for all that, I just have a couple of questions. Like, what's the protection from asymptomatic cases? Why are we waiting for students to be symptomatic before we demand tests? What are we communicating and recommending specifically around home testing? Why are we telling people the protocols and this will be over by April and then we'll get rid of masks? And if we have so many positives, why aren't we opening up remote options so that kids who are forced to be home or people who are forced to stay away have the option of being able to be more involved in the schools? And this isn't chicken pox, it's not one and done. It's one and one and one and one over and over again. So Andrew, we may have to go through those one at a time. Uh, What's the protection I, from asymptomatic cases? So, you know, Joanne or Diane, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, what we know about transmission and the likelihood of transmission around symptomatic versus asymptomatic individuals. Joanne, I may need you to chime in here. Um, we know that vaccinated symptomatic people do tend, the studies that I've read seem to spread less virus. Um, I believe that is, is the case. Um, asymptomatic folks, um, from what I've read, again, they're still learning, do not tend to spread as much. And in addition, what protections do we have? We are still masking. 
doors are open in the in windows are open in the schools. We have MERV 13 filters and high air exchanges. Um, the children are coached and told to be distanced. Um, I think that, and you know, the reality is we, we acknowledge that there is long COVID. Um, we have not, um, you know, seen it or heard about it in our community, but we know it does indeed exist. Um, fortunately, what we're hearing, our children are getting well and returning and going on. Um, Joanne, I don't know if you'd like to add anything on that. No, I, I think that's it. I mean, certainly um, the uh, the testing. You know, it's interesting when we see the testing coming back uh, on the on the antigen tests. It's interesting that the difference in the speed at which the um, the tests show positivity between somebody who's vaccinated and somebody who isn't. And you know, I I know from reading the papers that you know if you measured that actually in the lab, as Diane said, the um, if you're vaccinated, the spread is the spread is is far less. Um, we see that even on the test, it's very it, it's very hard to read the test if people are vaccinated, they show positive. They're what we would call very very mildly showing it. Um, and I would agree with Diane. You know, we we've got we you know that's why we've, it's good that we're keeping the masking um, at the moment in the schools. Yeah, and I, you know, I would say I, I come back to um, a little bit of what we talked about earlier with the test and stay program and some of the data around that. That gave us probably our most um, uh, accurate look into how the virus might be spreading inside of our classrooms. And in particular, you know, to qualify for the test and stay program, students had to be unvaccinated. They had to be a close contact in a classroom setting at that zero to three foot range. And so the fact that we've given thousands and thousands of those tests um, and only a few have actually come back positive um, is really telling about all of the other mitigation strategies that are in place. Um, and that's with a population that has not been vaccinated and so does not have that initial layer of protection that of vaccinated students may. Um, most of the data from that, I will also say, was prior to elementary students being able to get vaccinated. Um, we've seen a significant decline in the use of that program since um, elementary vaccination. So I, I think, you know, I think the evidence around that um, is probably pretty significant in terms of what we're seeing. I think my concern about asymptomatic cases at this point is that we are turning down the ability to catch asymptomatic cases before they turn symptomatic or when they're out there at all. And we're doing it at a time when a variant has become far more contagious. Um, I'm grateful for the mitigation strategies, even on the coldest days of the year or the decade. I'm grateful for the mitigation strategies that we have in place. But without knowing who's asymptomatic inside, you could have 10 asymptomatic kids who are all spreading and continuing to spread. You know, what's not measured is not managed. And that's what has my concern. No, I, actually, you know, you're raising a great point with that because one thing we didn't talk about a lot is the delay in the, the results coming back from state labs. Um, we've now had multiple scenarios where we've pulled tested students um, and we're actually not receiving the results until after or on the last day of what a student's isolation period would be. Yeah. So, for example, um, I think there was a scenario with Miriam where, you know, what it, I, I think we tested in McCarthy Town on like a Wednesday, might have even been a Tuesday or when, I forget the when, whether it was Tuesday or Wednesday, Wednesday. But we couldn't actually reflex those students out and, and identify until the Monday after uh, because we just weren't receiving the results. So ultimately, even with the pool testing, we would have completely missed students' isolation period. Um, so, you know, that, that that idea of catching asymptomatic cases quickly, um, I know it feels good, but it's it's just not happening anymore because of the delay. In yeah. And and I just want to add as well, um, speaking to the um, the nurses at the Board of Health who deal with all the cases for Acton and Boxborough, um, they said it's, it's become very clear that the majority of spread is going on outside of the schools. Um, it's it's household spread, it's um, social spread, um, and that's 
that's where they sing it. And that's really why you think about it, it's peaking after Christmas, after um, Halloween. You know, it's, it's people are getting together outside of the schools. They're taking off their masks. They're getting all together in the houses. And, you know, they're, they're pretty consistent saying that, you know, the majority of spread is happening outside. And um, that's what we're still seeing. Right. Um, it looks like we might have lost Peter. Um, Andrew, I, I think you probably have some additional questions that haven't been answered. Um, given the fact that this was pretty, pretty we'll new. We'll catch up later. Yeah, I think the best bet would be to, to connect back with Peter. Uh, Nora, I see that you still have your hand up. As long as you think you can manage without Peter helping us out, I'm happy to take your question. And you are still on mute. Darn, I thought I had that. I still had lowered my raised hand. Um, I just wanted to say thank you also for the presentation and um, for staying so on top of the current knowledge that we have. And sometimes it's hard to stop doing something that you've been doing, but I really appreciate the fact that you're um, just being so thoughtful and careful about weighing out what benefit we get from doing the testing that we're doing and being careful with um, time and resources and making sure that um, it's valuable to do testing. And when you discovered it's not valuable anymore, I really appreciate the fact that you're willing to kind of change and pivot because that's something that COVID's really demanded from us to just be able to be flexible and stay on top of the current research. So um, just wanted to say, I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, that's all. <clears throat> Thanks, Nora. I have one more. I, I guess I have one more response. I think to Andrew um, into your your worry about asymptomatic cases. Um, one of the things that I've you know been been able to watch and really see, and Joanne and Diane both spoke to it in terms of that clinical judgment. And you know, a, a good case is that one of our um, one of our teams we had some concerns because a couple of the members were positive, um, and so because we were so concerned with the 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 Speed uh, and the spread of Omicron, we said, you know what, this is probably a case. This team spends a lot of time together. We probably should, you know, reach out to families, make sure we have consent, and let's do testing. And so we did test um, the team, almost all of whom were asymptomatic, and yet a very high percentage of them tested positive. So we are really paying attention to cases where we have some suspicions. Um, and we're also, I think, you know, seeing that happening in households as we work with the Department of Health. Like we can watch on our trackers, we'll see, you know, the sibling and then the, the other sibling. And, you know, in the case of a, a student who tests positive at school, if they have a sibling in school, we're pulling that sibling who may be asymptomatic and testing them before they go home just to make sure. Um, and you know, finding out right away whether or not they are. So we're not totally quitting um, the asymptomatic piece. I think we're just really trying to be smarter and more um, more focused about it, um, if that offers any um, any help as we think about this. But thank you for the question. Thank you, Don. Thank you very much. Thanks, Don. All right, I see one uh, question from the public. So uh, Corinne, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, thanks. Is, is Peter still uh, still off? He is still disconnected, yeah. Okay, well, I'll, I'll ask my question. It's really, I think, for him because the decision has been put in his hands with regard to applying for a waiver from the mask mandate. Um, all the information that you showed shows that the district is well over 80% vaccinated and people have attested here too, and the da state data bears it out, that the transmission in the schools is... Um... Oh, hi, Peter. Uh, and it's just... Yeah. I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I'm Corinna. I think I might be interrupting you. I'm so sorry. I'm, well, that's okay. Well, I was you. You were my my target, but not in a bad way. I don't think. Um, <laughs> anyway, I was asking about the you know what was what will be the timing for putting it for a waiver from the mask mandate. This the district is as well over eighty percent, especially the junior high school and high school. Um, there's no tran There's practically no transmission in the schools, and really. If you're not going to make people mask at home, there's no point in having them mask anywhere else. I'm looking at the state data, 22,000 out of less than 23,000 23, of the cl ongoing clusters in the state are due to household transmission. Um, it's just masking students just is pointless. It, I think all the data shows that. And so I'm hoping that you will. I know that Acton has an indoor mask mandate right now. 
but I'm hoping that you'll proactively put in for a waiver from that so that as soon as they lift it, the kids can go mask optional. Yeah, um, you know, I don't have a timeline. Uh, I'll be honest, if, if Omicron weren't here, I think we'd actually be, you know, looking at doing something. Um, I, I think, I, I don't have a timeline because I just don't know what this is going to look like. Um, we don't have, we're missing some information from the state still um, about what to expect. So, you know, I know the state has extended its mask mandate as well. Um, you know, I... Yeah, I don't have a better answer than that right now. And sorry, I missed the, the beginning of that. All right. Uh, I am going to move us on, seeing uh, no more comments from the committee, because uh, we do have a, a lot of other topics ahead of us tonight. Um, if you see, if you look at the agenda, you will see that um, there was an item G, which was the protocols for responding to incidents involving hate and bias. Uh, Peter, do you want to mention just briefly how we've been sort of reshuffling the agenda just to make sure that we have time for the right things and what our plan is around the discussing those protocols? Yeah. So, you know, we had planned to discuss the protocols for responding to hate and bias at this meeting. Um, that had been planned for a while. Um, and, you know, I think what we saw is as we returned from break and the need to modify some COVID protocols and the number of cases we were having in schools, um, the urgent took over the important in that scenario. Um, and we ended up focusing on that. The budget discussion really could not wait because we are on a tight timeline. I'm going to apologize. I'm trying to get this to work for me because I am now on a mobile device because um, my computer has lost internet access. So, um, you know, we're going to do a budget presentation because we have to. Um, and I think what we were really concerned about, we know that three and four hour school committee meetings become really challenging, um, not only for committee members, but for community to be able to consider some really important topics deeply. Um, and I think sometimes what we see, if we try and put too many things on an agenda, uh, we end up kind of doing a disservice to the importance of a topic. So we did postpone the responding to incidents of hate and bias until the next meeting. Don, is that your hand up? It is. I just wanted to thank Diane and Joanne and make sure that they get the most sleep possible tonight. So I just wanted to thank them and thank them and tell them they can go. Yeah. yeah. Thanks both so much. Thank you very much. Evelyn, see your hand up. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. I just wanted to say that, you know, as much as budget is important, at the end of the day, the budget is going to help the kids. And hate and bias in our community, in our school system, is are just as important as the budget. Because if the kids are not in a good place, whatever we talk about budget does not matter. So we can keep moving it, but this is an important conversation that we need to have in this community because it's really important. Kids are heading. We will sit here and talk about the budget if we don't have kids that are suitable to be in that school system. We're not doing our jobs. Thank you, Adam. Um, okay, so next item on the agenda is the budget presentation. Peter, recognizing that you're on a mobile device, how can we help you with this? Um, I am going to share the presentation. Um, although I, I appear, you know, to be in all honesty, I appear not to have any internet access right now um, on my home. Um, cause I can't even share a presentation. So Beth, I think you have access to the presentation. I don't know if it's something that you can project, Adam, you're now a co-host. So I'm hoping maybe you can give Beth, um, screen sharing privileges. I think Dave also has this presentation. Um, so he could potentially, you know, share his screen and bring it up. Hi. <laughs> we may have to curtail all the fancy animations that we did in the budget presentation just because of this, but, um, you know, it, so it might not be as exciting, but we'll see what we can do. And I am so sorry. And I even just went and told my son to get off the video games. <laughs> um, uh, all right. I, I can, um, I'm downloading the packet right now. So as a, as a worst case scenario, I can share the presentation out from the packet. Adam. Yes. Beth. I can send you the PDF. Oh uh, no, I can Oh, it's a, it's a Google Doc. I, um, Peter, do you think it's okay if I just share the um, PDF? 
presentation. That is fine with me. I can um, send you the PDF of it. I've got it. I'm good. Okay. Give me just a sec here to get to it. Right. I, I just want Peter to kick over to a Tic Tac. I mean, he's got the profile going, and, <laughs> you know, we'll have a little fun with the budget. You share it, it with me. I can share it. It's Marie. I can't share anything right now, Marie. Okay, sorry. I am dead in the water on my home Wi-Fi. I'm looking to see if I have it. I just want to express my appreciation for Adam and the fact that he's chair and not me. So thank <laughs> <you>. <laughs> All right. Uh, one more second here, and I will have this up to share. All right. Thank you, Adam. Yep. Um, so... You know, the, just a note about what a preliminary budget presentation is. Um, preliminary budget presentation really has kind of four main goals to it. One is to review the timeline and process for having adopted the budget. A second is to understand the drivers, fixed cost, local service implication, level service implications. Um, and it's a really high, high level overview of the FY23 budget. Um, this is a preliminary presentation. We call it preliminary just for that reason. Um, and we want to get some feedback about the overall budget approach so that we can inform next steps as we develop the budget. You can go next slide. Um, this is an iterative process and we go through multiple versions of a, a budget. The goal tonight is to get a big picture understanding of the budget, um, to understand what the budget guidelines for school committee are, our district goals, preliminary revenues and budget drivers, um, proposed staffing update, and overall budgetary impact on reserves and preliminary assessments. We will go through several other budget presentations, and you can read the details there. The most in-depth budget presentation that we do, where we actually provide the details behind various staffing decisions that we're making, uh, will come on February 17th. Um, and so you're not going to hear details tonight. That's not the purpose of it. It's never been the intended purpose of it. Um, but that is the February 17th meeting. The reason we save it for that is we know that there are going to be significant changes that take place, both to the context of the budget from a, a financial standpoint in the communities, um, as well as different decisions that we may make between now and February 17th. Um, so we don't want to go into so much detail now that um, we, you know, essentially, you know, don't have complete answers. So um, I would encourage people who want to know more in the detailed version of this to tune back in on February 17th as well. So this is some important dates in the original agreement. Um, I think the most notable change is that Acton has now moved its town meeting um, to May. So Boxborough um, is May 9th and Acton begins on May 16th. Um, that is notable. Boxborough schedule is now driving the decisions that we have to make in terms of timeline around budget. Um, we have to take a final school committee budget vote 45 days before the earliest town meeting. Uh, that will take place on March 17th. You can see the details of how that vote works. The budget um, and program presentation, as I said, is February 17th. That's the detailed version of this budget, it's several hours long, and we really do go into extensive detail about all the nuances of the budget. Um, and then we have our preliminary school committee vote also scheduled for that night. That's 25 days before the final budget deadline. That is just a signal from the school committee that this is the direction that we're intending to move forward. So uh, towns know what to expect. Next slide. So, you know, I want to just put on your radar as, as committee members. Um, we want to hear feedback on, you know, a whole variety of topics tonight, but there's three questions that we really need um, some direction from you in order to prepare the next version of this presentation. First is around the appropriate level of reserve usage. You're going to see a couple slides around reserves. Um, how much of our reserves we want to use in developing this budget will play a significant role in our next iteration of this. As well, we need to hear from the committee around your stance on all-day kindergarten um, and then the overall impact on the community. So, for example, um, we need to get a sense coming out of tonight. The overall budget number we're presenting, um, is that a number that you're comfortable with? Is that too high? Is that... Um, 
are there too many reductions for you and you want to come in higher? We, we just need to understand from you what we're targeting um, and the overall assessments. And then, as I said before, any other feedback that you have from us. I want to go through the budget guidelines. Um, we had a series of ongoing guidelines that you developed this year um, and have voted. The ongoing guidelines were to prioritize student needs in alignment with the district's strategic planning goals, evaluate opportunities to use existing resources, align services and supports in a fiscally sustainable manner that recognizes the economic means of the community, consider historical and alternative revenue sources and evaluate their ability to subsidize the appropriated budget, monitor reserve trends in light of the economic conditions and school committee policy, monitor funding and continued work toward implementation of the capital improvement plan, evaluate the plan to eliminate all day kindergarten tuition and set rates for FY23 as appropriate, and prioritize funding for programs that support students with IEPs, English learners, students who are income insecure, students of color, and anti-bias, anti-racist strategic initiatives. Some other budget guidelines. There were several specific to FY23. First was to expedite implementation of the district's MTSS plan to address disproportionate outcomes for students in high-need subgroups, to incorporate costs associated with opening the boardwalk campus, provide funding needed to promote recruiting, hiring, and retaining a more inclusive and representative educator workforce, and five, develop a flexible budget that is responsive to ongoing uncertainty caused by the pandemic, and I'm not going to go through all three of those. Um, the next section is on new revenues budget drivers. I want you to pay particular attention here because this is the part of the budget that really provides the framework for the context we have and the challenges that we have ahead of us. Next slide. So we have revenues that come into the district and they take multiple forms. One is in what we call chapter 70 or foundation aid. As a regional district, we also benefit from regional transportation and then we also receive charter school reimbursement aid. Um, what you will see is um, that chapter 78 is budgeted. Dave, I believe it's $30 per pupil right now we have in the budget. Um, that is a very modest increase. That is all we get on an annual basis at this point. Regional transportation aid um, is slated to go up slightly um, based on what we anticipate for ridership. And then charter school reimbursement has ended, so that gets zeroed out. So overall, we're expecting a about $420,000 in additional uh, revenue coming into the district next year. That's balanced um, from some other areas though, however. So we are actually expecting about 50,000 less in Medicare reimbursement. We know that the investment environment right now is challenging. So we actually anticipating $115,000 less of investment income. Rental income will be slightly down and um, so overall, it, we're about 172000 down. So when we consider state aid um, and the different types of state aid we get, plus some of these other revenues, it's actually only about $250,000 to the positive uh, going into next year's budget. It's a little over a percent increase. So again, about $250,000 for the overall increase. Um, I want to talk about district reserves. Um, the district actually overall, in terms of reserves, continues to be in a relatively stable position. Um, and I'm going to talk overall reserves, and then we can talk a little bit about excess and deficiency. Um, if you look at reserves as a percentage of the budget over the last five years, it's actually relatively stable. Um, and has gone between 6.6 .6 and, and a little over 7%, almost up to 7.5%, if I can see on the mobile device. Um, you know, the... One area that that's a little bit different is in terms of excess and deficiency. And sometimes we consider excess and deficiency um, separately because it is essentially the school district's version of free cash. And it, the district has more control over how we choose to use excess and deficiency than we do some of the other reserve accounts. Um, it's also important to note that excess and deficiency um, is applied after the budget. Um, so it positively impacts assessments, but it does not decrease the overall budget for the district. Next slide. Preliminary use of reserves. One of the budget guidelines um, and one of the asks of school committee was to step back from the use of reserves in this budget, knowing that the excess and deficiency had been slowly going down over the last few years. 
Um, we have budgeted a total of 435,000 less in reserves next year than we're currently using. Um, from excess and deficiency, that's $185,000 less. Capital stabilization is about $50,000 less, and there's $200,000 less in transportation stabilization. With regard to transportation stabilization, um, just remember that um, that was actually a one-time transfer we made into transportation stabilization last year, knowing that we would then draw on it this year. And that had um, to do with a lot of the circumstances around COVID and the fact that we had a surplus last year in transportation because we weren't transporting as many students. Um, and we knew that we would need it this year in the budget to balance it. So this was actually a plan reduction of that $200,000, but there is also greater reductions with reserve use as well. Next. Some of the budget drivers for us um, in terms of expenses. Um, cost of living. Um, this is based on our existing staff and other um, needs that we know we have to add in to our uh, cost of living increases. So um, prior years, 3.6% increase. We've gone through all of our staffing for next year based on current staffing levels, and we're estimating that is about $2.7 million to seven and a half. We also have some other uncontrollable cost increases. Um, so for example, the first one is a million dollar swing in the budget, and we are estimating the impact of the 10% increase in health insurance rates uh, based on the uh, advice we've received for health insurance trust. We also know last year we had a plan to combine uh, Middlesex County retirement um, costs along with OPEB costs to cap those at a 6.5% increase combined, and so that is $217,000. And then we also know that we have to pay assessments for students going um, out of district for choice, charter, and Minuteman. Um, and so that is about $167,000. Other cost increases to the district, we are going to have about $150,000 um, of operating costs for the boardwalk campus for utilities. Um, that is in the operations department budget. We wanted to, uh, based on the capital subcommittee discussions we had with both finance committees last year, continue to restore about $150,000 in capital spending, reduce utilities subsidies from the ComEd programs. This is particularly COVID related. Um, we've talked to you about this in previous meetings, but just to uh, refresh memories, um, our community education revolving accounts in particular um, took a tremendous hit during the pandemic because they were not able to rent facilities, they were not able to run programming, um, and we didn't have the same type of programming for extended day that we had prior to pandemic. Um, we do not have the funding available in the ComEd programs to continue to subsidize utilities for the district or to subsidize custodial fees. Um, which is a decision that had been made, I'm um, going to say, seven or eight years ago. So we need to start to restore um, some of those budgetary items in the operating budget and reduce the reliance uh, on ComEd to subsidize it. Special ed tuition is the shining star of this slide. Um, we are actually anticipating um, two-thirds of a million dollars less in out-of-district special education tuitions next year. I cannot tell you that this is a one-to-one -one conclusion I can draw, but we have increased um, special educators. Uh, the number of special educators over the last, I think, six years in the district, I think it was since 2017, we've added 20 special educator positions um, to the district. We also have decreased the number of special education students by about 150 um, students overall. Um, a lot of the focus of the positions we've added in that time have been to build out specialized programs for students and ensure robust in-district special education programming um, that's appropriate for students. So we, um, I, I think the data we pulled, Marie had pulled some data for us, but um, I think going back historically, we had about 25 students that went out of district in elementary, and it's down to 12. Um, that's a significant cost savings. Um, it does certainly, I believe, speak to the need to continue to have robust special education programming particularly for students with significant disabilities. Um, we also last year funded some of our ed tech budget through a grant um, that was about $120,000 that needs to get restored in the operating budget. Um, we've certainly grown the use of technology in the district over the last year, um, and we need to make sure that we have the money to continue that. We also had a series of other cost escalators that were submitted by various departments and schools. And if we go to the next slide, I'll actually go into detail of what some of those were. 
there was about $100,000 of additional teaching and learning expense um, that we have to continue to fund because it had been offloaded into grant um, that we had received from DESE. And that grant goes away, but we still need to uh, work on that. That was a lot of our early liter early literacy work. Um, Medicare, um, this was through the finance department. They just did a more detailed analysis of Medicare expenses, and they have to raise that by about $29,000. Um, special education services speaks a lot to psychological services um, that we provide, particularly around testing, when the number of students we have to test exceeds the capacity of our existing staff. Um, so that's about $42,000. Um, filter replacement, um, you couldn't imagine we spend $71,000 a year on air filters, um, but these are all those HEPA air filters that we have in the the classrooms um, cost a significant amount of money on an annual basis to maintain and operate. Extremely modest increase in art, small increase in the DEI budget for various items, and then athletics um, had put in for a kind of a schedule of uniform replacements. Um, and so that's sitting in the budget as well. So that was $361,000 that you saw on the previous slide. So the total um, of all of the department requests, including cost increases, was about a 4.7% increase or $4.7 million. You can go right to the next slide. Uh, we also have to continue funding for some of our prior commitments that we've made as a school district. One was the initiative um, to implement MTSS, and we knew that that was a multi-year funding plan, so there's $122,000 for that. The all-day K phase-out of tuition was $180,000 that goes into the budget. Um, we have already included the restoration of CIP spending in this budget in another area that goes into the operations budget. So it's not showing up on this slide. Um, continuing our library media program build out um, last addressed in FY20. Um, keep in mind that the plan for this is not just to hire additional staff. It's actually transitioning um, to licensed staff from non-licensed staff. So it's actually not really a change in FTE, but it's an incremental cost. And then finally, we had hoped to renovate the admin building. We know our pre-K program is moving out in the fall. Uh, we wanted to use that um, for more district offices so that we could give more space back to schools. Um, I don't think that that's going to happen, at least right now. Um, that's a TBD. Um, we'll continue to explore it, but that's certainly not the highest level priority in this budget. So our leadership team had kind of a challenging context. Um, and as we started to meet as a team, we asked ourselves three guiding questions. One was who are our most vulnerable students and families? Two, how are they doing? What do they need from us? And what do you think they will need most next year? Leadership framing questions. Um, additionally, as we thought about what we were adding or eliminating from the budget, um, we thought would the decision we're making significantly advance, maintain, or limit our work in creating more equitable and inclusive schools and classrooms? Will be served by the decision? How would our most vulnerable students and families benefit? And what will our staff need in order to help them? As we um, thought about what we might need to add to the budget, um, we actually had used a little bit of a rubric um, and to build consensus within the leadership team between building principals and central office around what we needed to include as budget requests. So, Annually, we allow all building principals to submit requests as well as various department heads. We took all of those in, um, met as a group for the better part of five hours, and went through every single budget request that came in um, and had a lot of group discussions about them, made sure we understand why they were being requested, and then applied this rubric to it. Um, Tier one was something that Dave Marie and I came up with because we knew there were certain things that no one would ever want to vote for, but had to happen. Um, so for example, a prime one in there is that we have to return some of our um, utility costs and custodial costs from the ComEd budget into the operating budget. That's not gonna be a wildly popular item to do, but ComEd can't continue to exist if they have to keep floating that money. Level two are really those items that are both urgent and strategic. Um, and we needed to do, even if it required other reductions in the budget, urgent or strategic uh, at level three were areas that we thought were important uh, but, and we should consider other reductions, but we weren't 100% committed. They absolutely had to happen. Level four was what we could defer to a later time and level five was just not going to get supported at least right now. 
Um, in the budget that we're presenting, only request ranked is either level one or two are being presented to. Level one. Um, so we had to restore some of the custodial costs. I already talked about that. And that's already included in the HR budget that I mentioned earlier. Um, health insurance increase from above. Um, David estimated the 10% increase, but then as we did an analysis of all the individual staff between HR and our finance team, we have to increase that about 36,000 additionally. Um, we need to restore. This also deals with one of our revolving accounts. The pre-K revolving account can't continue um, to absorb costs from the ABA tutor it needs. So we have to move that into our HR budget. That was already included. Um, we needed the utility subsidy from ComEd to be incorporated into the operating budget. Um, that's $170,000. Um, the reason it's actually, this is showing up as a savings on this. Um, we were going to do $345,000. We actually think that we can step that down gradually over a few years. Um, we don't want to create a pendulum that swings where we overdo it in year one and then realize we did too much. Um, so we're going to go about half that. So it actually shows up as a bit of a cost savings. Um, and then the cost for the boardwalk campus was already included in the operations budget. You can go to the next slide. Urgent and strategic needs. Um, there were four that we're proposing for this, um, at least that are going into the operation, operating budget. And you'll see some additional ones on the next slide that are not operating budget, but we're looking at grant funding for. Um, one, English language educator. This is probably one of our top priorities as a district. Um, we have had an influx of newcomers into the district and newcomers are students who this is their first year in district and they do not speak English. Um, it's not just about the size of the caseloads of our English language educators, although we do have some concerns there, but it's also the intensity of needs. We're not, um, we're not going to be able to be in compliance if we don't add this as a staffing position. So this is a must have urgent and strategic need. Um, this is also something that aligns with the school committee budget guidelines around prioritizing high needs populations. The literacy coach um, is part of our MTSS build up plan. Um, McCarthy Town and Miriam are the only two schools in the district as elementary schools that do not now have a literacy coach. We believe this is actually a critical position to build out. Um, this speaks to efforts to reduce disproportionality. It speaks to um, efforts to build out the MTSS program, use data effectively in our classrooms to guide instruction, um, and also to implement the early literacy program. So that's included as level two. Early literacy resources, um, you know, we've been working hard on our early literacy program. We need to purchase decodable texts as a district for all of our elementary classrooms. That's not inexpensive, but has to be done. And then finally, um, what we've seen is we, and I talked about this earlier when I talked about kind of the special education, actually the reduction in out-of-district tuitions. As we have developed really robust programs in our school, we need to increase leadership at the building level in special education because um, managing the caseloads in our schools can become um, cumbersome and it, it, it leads to less effective programming if we don't have the right level of leadership. Um, so we it, definitely at Blanchard, we want to increase the 0.5 person to a 1.0 and then we're evaluating whether to increase either at Conant or McCarthy Town. Uh, elementary schools who also have programs, um, and which of those two schools uh, needs to target that change from a 0.5 to a 1.0. Um, so overall, that's an increase of 1.0 special education uh, leadership. This um, slide, uh, this was not in the original published packet, um, but I wanted to include this here. There were other um, services that we thought were urgent and strategic needs that we had included in the budget, but then we also saw an opportunity uh, based on ARPA guidelines to be able to actually slide these over to ARPA uh, for the next three years. So one is adding $100,000 under equity focused services for school-based leadership for culturally responsive schools. And essentially what we want to do is have incentives to have our educators in each school lead work and facilitate professional learning around anti-bias culturally responsive practices. This was actually something that we had talked about with our family advisory last year, um, that we need more leadership for this at the school level. So we're including $100,000 there. We also are including $50,000 um, of additional leadership for anti-bias professional learning. Um, and these are professional development costs to increase the number, number of seed leaders in the district so that we have at least one seed leader at each school. 
if you recall, we require seed training, which is anti-bias training as part of our educators contract uh, within the first three years in the district. We think we need to significantly ramp up this program um, in the next year or two to make sure that we can meet our obligation to provide that training. We also believe that by having our seed leaders work at the building level, the relationships they have with other educators in the building can help accelerate the work we're trying to do. Social emotional learning. Um, we have included $67,000. It's a, called the Social Emotional Screener and Data Dashboard for MTSS. This actually does a little bit more than that. Um, not only is it a social emotional screening tool, um, but it also provides a variety of resources that educators can use in their classroom, um, including from a whole series of evidence-based social emotional curricula, like Second Step. Um, I know Open Circle is being phased out, but they still have some of those resources. Um, the data dashboard component of this allows us to have a social emotional screener that also imports all of our iReady data as well as MCAS data into the tool so that each team um, and teachers at the building level can easily visualize all of the data in one location um, as part of the MTSS program. And then the other piece that uh, this tool will do for us, this actually includes a whole variety of surveys and in particular around um, student connectedness, um, diversity, equity, inclusion efforts, and perceptions around that, um, family perceptions around um, school climate and culture that we can also use um, as a district to really enhance how we're surveying families and understanding how students and families are connected to our schools. And then the last one is small but important. Um, this is leadership for an advisory program at the junior high school. Uh, we want to have teacher leaders help lead and develop the junior high advisory program. We know that's going to cost some money, so we're including it here. Um, again, these would have been in the operating budget as urgent and strategic needs that are absolutely critical to our operation. Um, however, we, because they can qualify for ARPA funding, we do want to take advantage of any possible grant funding um, in defraying some costs. So this is kind of our scorecard going forward. Um, you know, when we talk about, you know, kind of the revenue side of the budget, um, if you look at reserves and revenues together, we're anticipating about um, going down about $180,000. If you start to look at expenses, we're now up to just over $5 million, uh, which would be a 5% increase. Those two numbers don't work well together, obviously, and are providing an absolutely um, critical challenge for us this year. So we're working through that. And I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the strategies uh, we're doing. In order to figure out um, what the actual budget gap we have ahead of us, we, have, we had to make some assumptions. Um, and we had in the ALG plan um, last year, we'd been carrying, I think, three and a quarter percent as a as an operating budget assumption. Um, there was no way we could come in and propose an initial budget um, that hit three and a quarter, just looking at what the needs of the district were for a level service budget. And even with very, very modest increases. Um, so we targeted a three and a half percent increase, which is about three point five million dollars. Um, and then that because we were using some reserves and less reserves in this case, the actual assessment increases to the towns were higher at 4.5%. So the net position with the budget increases, if we assume a 3.5% budget increase, and this would be the assessment amount uh, in pink, um, plus everything I've already shown you, the net position of the district is that the budget is imbalanced by just about 1.8 million to the bad uh, or to the negative. So this is the challenge that our leadership team had to address in this preliminary budget is that we had about a $1.8 million budget gap between anticipated revenues and anticipated expenses. Next slide, please. So some of the strategies, um, this is the overview of some of the strategies, and then we'll go into a little bit more depth. Um, we, as we analyze this deeper, and, and even already this has gone through multiple iterations, we actually found that we had double counted the MTSS initiative uh, once. So that automatically can take $122,000 off the gap that we just saw. We also believe that the Assabet Valley 
wraparound services contract out of the DEI budget would qualify for ARP funding uh, for the next three years. Just as a reminder, that Assabet Valley contract, it's, it's a wraparound services contract where we can identify up to 30 student cases at a time and 30 families who need services uh, beyond what the school can help provide. So this would be, for example, families who need to find um, medical care, they need health insurance, they may need uh, mental health care um, from a family perspective, sometimes it's housing instability. Um, this is a service where an outside agency can actually work with these families to get them hooked up with all of the services that they need. Um, in the operations budget, we're continuing to pursue FEMA money to see if this can qualify. Um, and if that doesn't qualify, we can send that um, to ARP under that um, COVID mitigation measures. And that didn't nearly close the budget gap, though. And so what we had to look at were levels of reductions that we might make. We did these in levels so that our leadership could have a plan of attack with how to look at budget reductions through the budget. Um, we had three levels, each one, um, you know, not, not exact numbers, but each one is roughly $500,000 of reductions. Um, we had more levels beyond that um, in what the leadership team discussed, but we were able to come to you preliminarily with a balanced budget with the first three levels of this. Next slide, please. So similarly to how the leadership team looked at adding to the budget, we had the same approach um, with what we would need to reduce from the budget. Um, you know, this also had a heavy equity focus where we tried to focus on things that didn't create additional inequities for students or alter our strategic direction. Um, and in some cases, we thought there could be opportunities where we could reduce something through budget that actually might have reduced an inequity. Um, so next slide, please. You know, one thing I'll note, the, the difference here, it was very easy to come to consensus uh, with the leadership team over proposed additions. But as we get into reductions, um, those are finally have to be the superintendent's decision, um, certainly with a lot of input from the leadership team. But that's a challenge. Um, as we get into the next round of reductions, this is particularly challenging because some of these identify individuals. Um, that's always really, really hard. This was a tremendously challenging budget to put forward. Um, some of the reductions are easier to talk about. Some are not easy to talk about um, as a district. Um, and I feel terrible about that. But unfortunately, we also have to do some things that can get to a place where the budget is balanced. <laughs> In this first round of reductions, we had a couple of things that we thought were a little bit easier. Overall, we believe that we have a relatively stable reserve position, even if E&D is slightly declining over the last few years, we would at least propose, if we're looking to having to reduce, to at least maintain a level use of excess and deficiency going into this budget. So we planned that as a first reduction that's obviously pending school committee approval, but we put that at 185,000. We have three bus driver positions that have been unfilled for a while at this point, and we have balanced routes without using those. Uh, we can actually reduce those three positions without um, eliminating actual drivers that exist today. Um, and then one of the challenges that we had, we felt if we were looking at all levels of the district um, for possible reductions, we also had to look hard at senior leadership and look at what comparable districts might have in terms of the number of staff for senior leadership. Um, and one of the harder decisions I've made is that I am planning to reduce one of our assistant superintendent positions. Um, you know, right now that is the DEI position. Um, that's going to necessitate reorganization of central office because we know that, um, you know, we can never, when we reduce anything, we never provide the exact level of service that was there, but, um, what we do know is that there's also work that has to be assumed by other people. So we're actually going to be working with an organization over the course of the next several weeks and into the spring, um, looking at how we can organize the central office um, with one less person. Um, so that kind of is our plan moving forward. Those reductions in all are about $500,000. In level two, 
This is also hard because we're talking about individual people for some of these, um, but we have someone who works security positions, um, does a lot of our work with security cameras around the district, um, also prints a lot of our ID badges, helps with access control. Um, that work would have to get assumed by someone else, um, but that position is on this list. Uh, we had hired a capital projects manager a few years ago. We're coming to the conclusion of the bonding for the capital projects and the bulk of that work. We're also about to open the new building. We believe we can actually have the capital projects manager potentially stay on full time until the new building's open and then start to reduce that position afterward by 0.5. Um, high school clerical. Um, you know, we think we can actually reduce two part time positions in the high school um, in the faculty support center through attrition. Um, our our district, you know, if we look at enrollment projections that Marie did a, a few weeks ago, and, and we're not doing the detail on that today, but we've been in a period of declining enrollment for several years. And each year we've come to you, and prior to this year, you've seen, you know, one elementary class less, two elementary classes less. Um, we have not looked at the high school for possible reductions really during that time, um, but we are looking at um, reducing three. FTE, um, as we evaluate class sizes at the high school, um, that is to be determined. We always try to do reductions through attrition, but we also know that depends on departments, and programs, and things like that. So um, the exact positions are still TBD. And then elementary special education, um, this was a hard one to think about, um, but as I mentioned before, um, you know, over the last several years, we've added 20 positions in special education. Um, we've had a decline in the number of students we're providing special education services to. And we took a hard look at caseloads across the district, uh, not only in terms, and when I say caseload, it says, you know, fewer than 12 students, but we also talk about the intensity of needs of students as an important factor. Um, but we do have some caseloads where um, there are only six students and they are not students in our program. So they're students with less intensive needs. Um, we need to think about um, how we can be a little bit more efficient there um, in order to continue this. So um, additionally, in terms of with special education, in addition to reducing one position, we also have a grant that can fund one additional FTE in special ed. So out of the budget, it comes as two positions, but we're actually only reducing one position. Next slide, um, level three of reductions. Um, we are proposing that we reduce one grounds personnel. We know we have to add some custodial work to the new building um, in operations, um, but we do think that, you know, we're gonna have to reduce grounds personnel. Um, this is hard as well because we actually think we have the right number of staff, but in terms of the overall scope of what we're gonna be able to do, um, this did make the list. Um, in terms of school committee, one thing we need you to consider is what do you want to do with all day kindergarten tuition? Um, you know, we reached a point of the budget where we were struggling to make further reductions as a leadership team. So we want to have this conversation with you now before we figure out whether or not we need to go deeper. And then also on this list at this level would be a 15% reduction in the allocation we make to each school for elementary classroom assistance. We're not, this is hard to put an exact number of FTE to. Um, overall, our strategy would be that we would reduce the allocation of hours by 15%, but give the principals tremendous flexibility to determine how they wanted to use assistance. So they may want to have full-time assistance at three grade levels, but reduce other grade levels. Um, they may want to reduce one grade level of assistance, um, but it's $180,000 or about a 15% reduction of allocation to each school. That is roughly the equivalent of three classrooms at 12 hours. So if you looked at our original position um, and the new position, this essentially balances the budget. For an early um, budget presentation, being within $6,000 is as close as we need to be um, to say that this would balance the budget. Um, this is not easy. Um, these decisions are not yet final. We have a lot to go through. There are, you know, uh, is information shifting for us on a daily basis that we're going to have to consider. And I expect, you know, there'll be significant changes from iteration to iteration. Um, but this is where we are at right now. And this does balance the budget. Next slide. Um, just to give you a sense of overall FTE changes, 
We are proposing to add the equivalent of three positions. However, we are reducing, um, excluding the assistants, we're reducing 11.5 positions. Um, and then we're estimating that the assistant hours will calculate it out at about six. So the total preliminary change in FTE is to go down 14.5 positions as a district. Assessment assumptions. Um, Originally, we said we were targeting a 3.5% budget increase um, as we realized that part of that, uh, the reductions included using more E&D, that doesn't um, hit the operating budget, it hits the assessments. So the actual budget we're proposing tonight um, for discussion is 3.69%, uh, which is a roughly $3.7 million increase. You can see below um, the assessment increase stays with an earlier slide at 4.59%. The Acton percent increase right now would be 4.36. Boxborough is 5.8. Um, Boxborough, as a note, that's significantly lower than what we had been discussing previously. Um, we had been going off of some older enrollment projections, but when we looked at the actual enrollments, Boxborough did not gain nearly as many students as we had anticipated through the enrollment projections. So Boxborough's percent came down. And then this we have, it's essentially the same numbers, but in a chart that you see every year. Um, you can see um, that if you look at the second column, um, that represents the original information we presented with departmental requests before we made reductions. And then the FY23 superintendent preliminary budget is after we made reductions to get to that 3.69% budget increase. Um, when we get to this time of year, there's always late breaking information. So we have just learned that there's been a change to the federal final rule that they issued uh, regarding the allowable use of ARPA funding. None of this is finalized yet. And we have a lot of work to do to understand this more. Um, but the issuance is now that towns are allowed to use up to $10 million of their ARPA funds, not to exceed their total allocation. So. Acton didn't get more money. It's $9 million for Acton. But they can actually now use all of that as revenue replacement. This could impact how we access funds. Um, possible considerations for that could be the all-day kindergarten plan, the replenishment of community education revolving funds, which means we don't have to rely on it so much through the operating budget right now. Um, and we can let ComEd replenish some of the funds and then um, watch the ComEd revolving account over a few years and see how that plays out and how revenues increase again. Um, this needs a lot more explanation, but it is potentially positive news. We don't anticipate this would solve all of our problems, but it certainly could help. And so again, um, I would love to hear any feedback that you'd like to provide. Um, you know, Beth, I'm gonna rely on you for notes because um, usually I'm taking notes on my iPad, but I cannot because that's how I'm accessing this meeting now. Um, I really would like some feedback from you about the appropriate level of reserve usage. Do you want to use less reserves than we proposed? Did we propose about the right amount or do you want to increase the use of reserves? All day kindergarten is another area that we want to talk with you about and hear your desire to move on that. Um, what does the overall budget number feel like to you as a school committee? Um, and what about our assessment targets? And then any other feedback you have I do want to make one important note. We don't know where Boxborough's budget stands right now as of yet, but we do know from the ALG plan that even with these reductions, there is still a two, just about a $2 million gap on the ALG plan um, between you know, revenues and expenses. So even after we make $1.8 million of reductions, we know there's a $2 million problem to solve ahead of us still um, in concert with the town. So um, there's a lot to be discussed in, as we as we proceed here. So thank you. Happy to hear questions, feedback. Um, hey, thank you, Peter. Uh, give me just a sec to get everybody back up on the screen and make sure that the public can see anyone who's talking. Um, Ginny, you had your hand up first, so go ahead. Thank you. Um, so. Thank you for that. Um, you know, obviously there is a lot there and um, I'm honestly I'm struggling to absorb some of it, but um, I, I'd like to say nobody will be surprised by this. I think it would, um, 
I don't think that we can back off on our commitment to um, transitioning to universal all day kindergarten tuition free for all of our families in the middle of a pandemic um, where, um, you know, people are really struggling financially with jobs and, you know, with, with kids who have suffered um, loss of preschool um, and significant early childhood education. I just, I don't think that's not something that I could ever get behind. Um, and then I'm also extremely opposed to any cuts to our special education program. I think that those families are struggling. Um, you know, I mean, if you had to, you know, kind of plot on a, on a graph, the people who are struggling most, I think, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a no brainer that there are um, fed families who had their kids home while they parents were trying to work, they were unable to access resources. And I know from talking to many community members and educators um, that that there's a world of hurt going on in the SPED community. So for that reason, I would be opposed to cutting anything out of SPED. Um, and, you know, in, in, in terms of the, um, I think you said that, you know, caseloads are down and there are um, caseloads of, of less severe um, disabilities or needs, then I think that what you can do is you can reshuffle them among the, the educators as opposed to um, cutting somebody out. I, I, I would like, I would need a lot more evidence that that's something that would be appropriate at this point in time. Um, and I'm also, I'm also confused about what the screener, um, what the screener is and, and what they're supposed to do. So I would, I would like not necessarily tonight, but at some point, some explanation about that because that's just something that was a head scratcher for me. That's all. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I, I, I want to ask this question of you and, and, and everybody else who sort of makes these comments, you know, as Peter shared, we're on a very tight budget. So you've, you've expressed some concern around items that were listed as cuts. I guess the, the, the follow-up question that I have and that I'm sure Peter has as well is, how do you want to manage that? Are there other areas that you want to cut? Do you want to use from reserves? Do you uh, want to go to the town and, and try to fight for more money out of an extremely tight budget in, in Acton? So I think we need to give the, the administration some feedback, not only on what is it that we value and need to have in the budget, but also maybe how we balance that. Thanks, Adam. I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm open to discussing more about reserves. I understand from all the discussions we've had about the importance of reserves, but, um, you know, if we're talking about rainy day funds, it's pouring. Um, I don't know when it's ever going to pour more than it's pouring now. And I would um, personally be very open to using more reserves so as not to um, negatively impact our most vulnerable families and students. Um, and, you know, um, in, another, another um, issue is it seems like we might be prioritizing non-certified staff over certified staff. Um, I think that the ramp up in the SPED, the whole purpose of it, the co-teaching model, and um, you know the movement towards certified staff was something that was very deliberate. So I don't want to see us backtracking on that, which is um, what I see happening here. So um, you know, as much as I, I value paraprofessionals and, you know, and, and all of the, the staff that are working, I think we've had a strategic plan. And I think that we should be sticking with it. And this seems to be backing off that a little bit. So, um, you know, those are the three places that I would um, look for, you know, making up. And, and again, the screener is something I'm, I'm completely confused about. Great. Thank you. Tessa. Um, I'm going to piggyback a little on what, what Jenny said. Um, I would like us to explore cutting more than 15% of the regular ed assistance. This is something that we've presented on, been presented to year after year after year. We're like the only school district that does this. And I know um, from previous years that we spent almost a million dollars on regular ed assistance. Um, these are primarily 12 hour positions. And as Peter was saying, these are harder positions to talk about because if these are our friends and neighbors, these are often, um, you know, part-time jobs that, that moms and dads and other retirees are, are picking up. 15% is like the sixth grade classrooms. Sixth graders do not need 
12 hour week regular ed assistance. Um, so I'd like to see, I, I agree with Ginny in terms of the things that she doesn't want to see cut. I, I don't know how we could in good conscience cut any special education services. Um, and I agree with Ginny that our, our um, strategic plan has been to reduce uncertified staff with certified and replace it with certified staff. And I would much rather lose an additional $180,000 or whatever that number was um, in uncertified regular ed assistance that I will remind you, no other district has um, to, to keep that special ed position. Um, I work in a school and special educators are at the end of their ropes. They are expected to do so, so much because as Jenny mentioned, those kids are the ones who are suffering from all of this craziness that we're all suffering from um, the most. So, um, you know, I agree with some of the budget things. I think it's good that we've become creative as far as the um, screener. Um, if we can, if, if some of those mental health things <laughs> that our kids are struggling with can be covered by ARPA funds, I'm not sure a screener is what I would choose. Um, you know, increase staff, increase DBT training for staff who are already available, like increase um, the, the tools that teachers can, can use, not, not just screen. We already have kids in total crisis. Like, you know, let's, let's spend the money if, if it can be, be covered by ARPA under things that are going to actually really directly affect those kids who are already cutting, the kids who are already avoiding school, like the kids who, you know, are already displaying levels of anxiety that we haven't seen. Um, so I agree with the things that Jenny said um, that she didn't want to see cut. And I would like to see us, I, I, I would also be okay with, um, you know, using more rainy day funds, but I'd like us to be a little bit more creative and following our strategic plan in terms of looking at um, what, what positions to cut, not certified ones. Thanks, Tessa. Ben. So I want to also uh, piggyback on both what uh, Tessa and Ginny uh, were mentioning. As a parent of a special ed student myself, I see the value of having additional staff for special education. And the idea of cutting an already thin staff just does not do justice for our students in our, our district. Um, I also believe that we have made a commitment to all day kindergarten, and we need to see through that commitment. During this pandemic, Everybody has been impacted, um, whether it's socioeconomically, whether it's through um, emotional distress. Those two items alone add so much value to our district that by cutting those two programs or by cutting the all day kindergarten program and reducing by one FTE for special education, we will be harming your students in doing good. So if it means utilizing additional funds out of our rainy day funds, and so be it, because the health and well-being of our students is far more important than saving, you know, looking at $144,000 for, for one FTE person, and then uh, I think it was $180,000 for all day K. can't remember off the top of my head, but those are, are two very important programs that we need to see through our commitment. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. John. With respect to uh, reserves, um, you know, I'm also okay with using reserves, but, you know, for Dave's benefit, I want to comment that you can't solve a recurring revenue problem with one-time money. Um, so to the extent that we're trying to intervene in a pandemic recovery mode, and we think we need to do something for a year or two, then using that one-time money, either from reserves you know, or from ARPA makes perfectly good um, sense. But if we're doing things that represent ongoing programs and we're funding them with that money, that's just kicking the can down the road. So we just have to be a little uh, cautious about that. Uh, you know, with regard to Peter's question about, you know, strategic importance, I, you know, continue to agree with everyone um, who says, you know, we need to move the MTSS activities forward. Um, 
you know, I also want to pick up on what uh, Evelyn said that, um, you know, we need uh, to maintain our commitment to DEI. So notwithstanding that, you know, uh, we're going to be uh, losing a few positions, we'll still be hiring this year, you know, and that hiring, you know, ought to emphasize, um, you know, our desire to diversify our workforce. Um, so that should, um, should go forward. Then, you know, Peter also commented about uh, the decline in enrollment now reaching the high school and that allowing, you know, uh, some, you know, reduction of staff, you know, while maintaining reasonable class sizes. Um, you know, I think, you know, it's fantastic to see that Acton, which, you know, and Boxborough, which had historically been a district with the largest class sizes in the state, move, you know, sort of into the center of the pack. And I would love to be able to sit here and say that that is financially sustainable. It is not. Um, so, you know, it's not simply looking at the high school and saying that, you know, we need to let some of these classes get a little bit bigger. It means that, you know, throughout the system, as we look at some of these things, you know, we're going to need to let class sizes get a little bit bigger. And that really is, you know, sort of equivalent to the statement when, you know, Peter talked about redistributing some of this other work so that people are going to have to do a little bit more work. That's the reality of what it will take. Uh, to make some of this um, budget work. So with all of that, you know, being said, um, you know, I'm comfortable bringing uh, this, you know, preliminary budget to the ALG for uh, discussion, you know, recognizing, you know, as Peter said, that there's um, some work to do. And then I'll close by saying that, um, you know, I, I, I didn't think that uh, the Act and Select Board uh, was prudent, you know, in, committing the, the whole $7 million, you know, at the beginning of the year. And I feel even more strongly about that, you know, as this budget process is developing um, and as, um, you know, new possibilities arise for the use of that $7 million. So in the same spirit that Peter and the healthcare staff, you know, revisited our COVID strategy, you know, I hope that when we come back to some of these discussions, uh, the select board and finance committee uh, will be open to some revisitation of our ARPA strategy. Thanks, John. Evelyn. Yeah, so I would just like to echo some of the sentiments of my colleagues here that um. Special ed is an area that we should look at maintaining because it's important. Um, I just heard from a neighbor today that who have a special ed kid that they haven't had a bus service for some time now. So I know that that's a place where we, you know, a lot of people need it in our community. We need to make sure that we maintain it. The other area that is near and dear to my heart is DEI. We're a community that is really struggling in this area. As we make cuts, we have to make sure, and I'm glad that Peter has laid out a strategy, but a lot is happening in this community. We have staff that really could use more training, um, <laughs> anti-bias training. We ourselves sitting here in this community could use some of that. Um, we have a long way to go. I feel like the last year we've made a lot of strides. We've gone a long way and we've made a lot of, um, I don't want to say difference, but we, we've learned a lot and we've put in some structures. And I'm worried that with this reduction, that we're going to slide back to where we started from rather than building upon the blocks that we've put in place. This is an important area. If we're all going to coexist in this community peacefully, we have to do a lot around here. So... I hope that the strategy that Peter has laid out, that we're going to continue to build up on that and do more. Thanks, Evelyn. Uh, anybody else from the committee have anything that they would like to comment on, questions, uh, before we go to the public? Kira. I, I just want to make sure that we emphasize this point on on DEI. You know, this this what we see in this proposal. It it looks like our most vulnerable are the ones who are going to see, um, you know, are, are going to see the most impact um, when now the times are hard. Um, and I just want to make sure that when we when we come back with this document, um, because budgets are moral documents, that. 
Um, we're not we're, we're not telling our communities um, that that need us most that we're not investing in them. Um, so so however that looks, um, especially for this this DEI position and our DEI work, um, I, you know I, I think I would like to see how we can. Uh, you know, either find one hundred seventy-seven thousand dollars in 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 which we say outright, you know, this is you know, DEI is a thing that we're doing. This is how we're doing it, um, or um, or something else. I don't really know, but I, you know, I just want to make sure that you know Evelyn is heard, um, and that uh, you know the folks who are in our attend attendance, our yeah, our audience, are heard um, when we say that this is community that needs. Um, an I, a professional I, a, a person for whom DEI work is responsible for, um, because, uh, you know, otherwise we're, we're losing something extraordinarily important uh, to our mission. Thanks, Kira. Um, I, I would echo that comment as well. I think um, in, in looking at this and talking with, with Peter, but also getting some early feedback from the community, uh, I, I think we need to see uh, some way of bringing back a DEI position or an understanding of how that work is going to be done. Um, I think a lot of people are um, rightfully so upset by the fact that uh, that's, that activity seems to be going away. Um, and I think we, we need to see a little bit more from the, the, the administration around what's the plan. How, does, how do we get through this without backtracking um, or, you know, not even that, but how do we can, how do we make more progress on this? Because clearly there are members of our community and our committee who feel that we need to make more progress on this. And this is a, a really hard thing to, to see. Um, and then secondly, I think um, I, I would echo a lot of the comments uh, of the committee that I feel like where we're seeing cuts are not aligned with sort of the, the strategic goals of our district um, and where we're adding there, we're maybe seeing some of that, but it maybe needs to get spelled out a little bit more. And are we really putting um, the right money in the direction and in the areas that we know are our, our weaknesses? And and lastly, I you know I'll, I'll make a comment about reserves as well because John and I like to, to talk about reserves a lot. Um, and I've had conversations with Peter about this as well. I get really nervous when we start to spend down our savings account, our emergency rainy day fund. Um, but I think Ginny made a really good point. If not now, when? This is the, it's it's raining, it's freezing outside, literally. Now's the time to do it. Um, and I think we have to make a strong um, statement to our community that we're dedicated to um, addressing the urgent needs of our district. If we have to do that, we're gonna go into our savings account. But that also means that the communities that help fund this district may have to do the same if they value not only the education but the health and wellness and well-being of our students that they're going to have to meet us in that same location in that same place uh all right i see three comments right now from the public for uh well lots of, of public comments so um i, I do want to recognize that it's 9 45 um and so um i'm going to ask that the members of the public who wish to comment uh try to be as brief as possible. Tessa, I'll ask you to keep the uh, the timer at three minutes, but do give everybody that one minute warning. If you can do it in two, we'd really appreciate that. And then secondly, I wanna recognize that similar to our public participation, um, this is an opportunity for the public to make comments. Um, and obviously you're welcome to ask some questions, but um, because this is just the superintendent's preliminary, preliminary budget and noting the time, we're, we're not going to sort of have a back and forth and answer and question time. I'm happy to hear the questions. Peter's happy to hear the questions from the community. We'll take those in and we'll work to address those as the administration continues to develop the budget. And with that, uh, I'll invite Rabbi Mike to unmute. Thanks very much. Um... I thought synagogue board meetings lasted a long time. You guys are a marathon. Uh, I'm very impressed with your with your dedication. Um, I want to appreciate how hard it is to run any organization, uh, let alone a, a large organization with numerous schools and staff in a pandemic. It's been hard for us. Um, I have a lot of compassion for, for all of you. Um, I also want to appreciate the high school principal, uh, Joan Dean, who brought together a number of affinity groups to talk about some of the instances and situations, the bias and the hate uh, incidents that had happened in the school, in the high school. Um, I think that's a great step. I, I would encourage this group to take her lead. 
Um, I've learned from my friends in the disability advocacy community uh, a very powerful teaching, nothing about us without us. And we're still struggling as a community when you're making decisions like this about getting rid of a staff person, about shuffling budget priorities. There is still no outreach or collaboration with members of the affected communities. And I don't understand that because many of us have offered our time, our wisdom to this group, to various groups in our towns. Um, we're here to help. If you want support on making such a huge change as getting rid of an assistant superintendent, talk to us about your plan. Um, I'm, I'm a little concerned that the plan doesn't address some of the things that um, I have been advocating for and some other members of the community have been advocating for, a clear reporting procedure that's transparent both for students and staff and faculty, a dedicated advocate, somebody that if I'm having an issue with bias or hate, I know I can speak to that person and they're not going to be weighing all the needs of the different constituents. They're going to be on my side. And a recognition One minute. that evaluation and promotion will be based partly on my commitment as an employee to DEI. That's something people will only respond, some people only respond if they know their evaluation and their promotion are um, are dependent on it. Um, C training I saw as part of the the, the plan. Um, C training uh, so far isn't cutting it. Certainly with anti-Semitism, we've heard from a staff member at uh, AB that uh, it wasn't anti-Semitism wasn't even addressed, and she was mocked for bringing it up. Um, we still have issues with the N word being used. Um, there's a video that's about to I, I think be shared throughout the community of AB students, high school students, jokingly using the N-word numerous times. Without a plan to really address bias, how will this group feel about defending the decision to take away the assistant superintendent when that video hits the internet and perhaps the media? We got to think clearly, I'm here to help. I know there's a lot of people here to help in creating a, a sustainable and lasting plan. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Right, Sarah, go ahead and unmute. This is, this is actually Michael at Sarah's computer. Um, I think it's very important for the schools to be a safe environment. We know that unsafe schools where, where students feel unsafe, they cannot learn as well. I'm very disturbed to learn that this position of assistant superintendent for DEI has been eliminated. I think it's vital to have a person who has full-time responsibility to improve equity and inclusion. Um, and the, the moving down the, the until the next time, the, uh, the discussion of protocols for how to deal with hate and bias. Um, reinforces a sense that this is not the priority that I believe it should be. Um, and uh, I've become more aware of that there's a lot more incidences, bias incidences in the schools that I was aware of. And I think this should be communicated to the general hacking community and not just kept within the uh, school com community. And I think that, that this move is, is in the wrong direction. I also support the comments that the uh, special needs families are the hardest hit by this and that, that we should not back off on our commitments to them. And uh, I believe the comment that if you have a rainy day fund that now it's pouring is a very appropriate comment and, and should be a, a, a guiding idea in uh, where we, uh, it, what we do with our, our reserve funds. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Leah, you are welcome to unmute. Thank you. Um, I'm Leah Lally. I teach first grade at Miriam. Uh, as you consider the budget proposals, I would ask that you keep the social and emotional well being of all students at the core of your decision making process. Right now, we are seeing students whose needs are great. The staff who are best able to support them are teachers, special educators, school psychologists and counselors, and classroom and special education assistants. We already don't have enough supports in place, 
So please do not cut positions that provide consistent, direct service to our students. Please don't ask us to do more with less. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Amanda, I'll allow you to talk and then you can unmute. There you go, Amanda. Thank you, Adam. So my name is Amanda Bailey. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. And I wanna say first that as you look at redistributing the responsibilities of the assistant superintendent, as you look hard at the needs that you please, please consult with the DEI Family Advisory and get their perspective and their input about what the community needs from that lens. Um, they have to be a critical component in that restructuring. Um, I want to, <laughs> having been through five special education directors and four superintendents, including interims. Um, I want to just add a little context beyond we've added 20 special educators. We added 20 special educators because we were operating on a shoestring and paras. And as we drew down the paras in favor of certified staff, that was the value. That was the priority was getting certified staff in front of students, every student. So it doesn't track then that we would at this point continue um, to state that as a commitment toward co-teaching and to plan instead to, to draw down the number of special educators even by one. If we have fewer students but increased needs, shuffle, please don't cut. Thank you for your time, your consideration in developing all of this, Peter, for um, developing the presentation for tonight. And, uh, Thanks, Amanda. Christine, you're free to unmute. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, you're a little quiet. If you could just make sure you're speaking up, you should be good. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, I would like to recommend one way to help um, keep funds going towards the teachers and special ed. And that is for the school committee to pause the mascot change. I say this because um, on October 15th of 2020 school board meeting, which was the first and only time the committee considered the economic cost of replacing the mascot, um, Superintendent Light said it would likely cost about 400,000 uh, and would be gradually implemented. However, Shrewsbury also did a cost uh, study and estimated that the mascot change would cost them 2.2 million. Um, and one example of an expense that's you know, on this current budget is uh, the district's suggestion of spending $76,000 on new uniforms, even though the athletic director made a substantial purchase of colonial uniforms prior to the committee's vote to retire the mascot. Therefore, I believe this money could be spent on keeping a teacher employed in, or the special ed teacher instead of spending it on uniforms that were just replaced. With Acton Boxborough being $2 million over budget and are talking about cutting special ed and other teachers, not one penny of this budget should go to the divisive and unpopular project of replacing the mascot. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Okay. Um, seeing no more hands up in the public, uh, I do want to go around the committee one more time if there are any other questions or comments before we move on. Seeing none, uh, we will move into our uh, subcommittee member reports. Um, so for those of you keeping track at home, it is 9.57. And now we're going to do our whirlwind of reports. Please be sure to ask questions if you have any. Uh, first one is over to Budget Subcommittee with Kira. So, uh, you know, Budget Sub has been working on the bulk of what you saw tonight. And by Budget Sub, I mean the administration did it. But we've been discussing this. Um, and so I won't waste your time with that. In your packet, you will see two letters that I have written to our legislative um, representatives in both the state and the federal governments. Um, because the other part of the story is that we have been um, often, you know, stonewalled is a hard 
and, and maybe a strong word, um, but, you know, denied access to aid allocations um, from both the federal government and the state government. Sometimes we've gotten money, but just not um, all that we could get. Sometimes we've gotten no money at all. Um, the state letter went out um, this morning, um, and I haven't had a chance to send to the federal. I'm going to work with Jenny on getting uh, contacts for that. Um, but, I, you know, in your time, I am hoping that you will consider reading these two letters and joining me in asking our um, legislators for some help and some advocacy um, so that way we can we can get some of the reimbursement back that we in 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 good faith invested in keeping our schools open for an entire school year during the pandemic and are now um, budgeting with a gap to start another school year and you know i hate to be that person but whatever we do in next school year we'll have covid mitigation as probably part of that. So everybody get ready. And it's expensive. Um, and we need help with that. We need help now. Um, so I, I'm hoping that these letters um, that you can see um, spell out that urgency, um, make a case for why we um, are worthy of more, um, and hopefully we'll persuade someone to um, shake whatever trees are available. <laughs> so that way um, more money can come our way. Thanks, Kira. Uh, any questions or comments? Um, I, I do have a question. Since Kira will, uh, hasn't sent the uh, letter out to the federal uh, delegation yet, uh, I'm curious if the committee would like that letter to be signed, not just uh, on Kira's behalf, but from the committee as a whole. Um, I'm going to take a, a show of thumbs as a consensus of the committee that we would like to do that. Um, so, Kira, we can work to um, make sure that that version of the letter uh, comes from the committee as a whole. Um, there was a hand that went up, but it went back down. So, great. Kira, I applaud you for the um, initiative that you took to help, um, obviously, help us close our budget gap and, and raise awareness with our state and, and federal um, legislators on, on this important need. Well, thank you for your support, everyone. I, I want to thank Dave. Dave is the one who's been sounding this alarm. I, you know, this is this is not about me. This is about Dave. Dave's been the one on the phone. I'm sure he's his team has been on the phone. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm good at writing. So I wrote a letter. Um, this is but this is David's work. So thank you so much. Thank you both. Uh, all right. Moving on to policy subcommittee update. Nora. Um, our update will save some time tonight. We don't have a lot to report. Um, we're just moving forward, still working on a policy um, that we hope to present at, I believe, the next school committee meeting. Great. Thank you. Andrew, community engagement. Thank you, Adam. Uh, school committee community engagement minutes. We met on December 17th, reviewed social media policies for other districts and communities, as well as our own community engagement use cases, defined or discussed defining areas of communication that would help separate public communications from private communications, made sure that we would have alignment with school public, school district public view policies maintain record keeping and uh, open meeting law compliance. Our next steps will include defining a workshop to structure school committee engagement strategy and activation and draft an outline for the policy committee of our recommendations. The next meeting's tomorrow. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Um, capital improvement, Yevin's not here, but I think John, you have something prepared to report on that subcommittee, as well as a report of the finance committee, the Act and finance committee from this week. Yeah, so uh, Yevon uh, tasked me to report on uh, the meeting that he chaired on Tuesday. Uh, JD reported that the actual capital spending uh, totals $8.1 million for 33 projects against the plan that was associated with the bonding, uh, which had us at about $9.5 million at this point. Uh, but given projects in progress, we are on track with the plan. Since the overall plan calls for $21 million in spending, we have completed more than one third of the work. Um, JD has made progress with the online capital presentation. Uh, there's still some issues there that he has to address. Um, the capital subcommittee will meet again to discuss the capital proposal for FY23. If there are no questions, I will um, move to the um, report of the finance committee. Um, yes, so I just 
on the uh, finance committee on um, which also met on Tuesday. Um, Alan Mitchell and Charlie Cadillac noted that enrollment predictions I have been very volatile and given recent demographics, AB enrollment may continue to decline. Um, they believe that enrollment may reach levels that do not justify the size of current school buildings. Uh, they requested that the Finance Committee form a subcommittee to study this issue and report to the town. The Finance Committee felt that they had no special expertise that would allow them to support a new enrollment projection. The Finance Committee, however, would like a presentation from uh, the schools you know, in particular, recognize that Maria is really the one with uh, expertise on the subject of enrollment. Um, the Finance Committee does believe that providing oversight of the school space utilization is part of their responsibility. This oversight, along with oversight of district capital, can be conducted in the current structure of the committee. Uh, several committees members also spoke to their desire to see an integrated school and town capital plan. Thank you, John. Uh, last is an update on the mascot screening committee. Peter, that group met uh, before the holidays, it looks like. Yeah, we did meet. Um, so we had our first meeting of the mascot screening committee. We've had one meeting so far. It was really an orientation meeting to go over open meeting law, public records, things like that. Um, but the best part that we were able to do was hear from our student representatives to the committee about the progress they've made. Um, as you know, there's a working group at the high school of students working on this. Um, their biggest piece of progress is that they have developed a survey um, that they are going to be sending out to the entire school community. I expect that actually to be going out this weekend, um, looking for initial ideas about a mascot to be moving forward. Um, they have a plan to publicize that widely, uh, not only via social media, but through direct email. They have plans to reach out to both town managers to try and get on their list serves um, so we can get it out to community members. Um, they have gone so far, they actually, I believe, have QR codes that they're going to be posting around to different businesses in the community um, to really just generate some buzz and enthusiasm for this and solicit a wide range of feedback from all sorts of community members. So um, we have a meeting coming up in about another week and a half. We're looking forward to that and um, you know, look forward to kind of continuing to hear students' progress. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. Um, it looks like we have one uh, member of the public who wished to speak. Um, Mr. Benson, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, I just know that there were a number of students that said they also wanted to participate on this committee. And um, it's, as, as far as we're concerned or heard, we haven't, um, this committee wasn't really open to all students. Has there been a way to make it more inclusive so students, um, all students can participate in it? All right. So, Mark, students can talk to the high school principal. Okay, and then secondly, I just wanted to ask, um, there seems to be a real rush to get out the, um, to move on with this process, but yet a lot of public records still have yet to be released. Um, are we planning on, um, are they planning on being released at some point soon? So, Marty, what I'll speak to is we're moving on with the, the mascot naming process. So, still, but thank you. Still a legal obligation to release the records. All right, um, Marty. I think if you want to, you can continue to have that discussion with Peter. But I don't think it's uh, germane to the topic of the mascot screening subcommittee report. So, thank you. That's fair. Um, all right, moving on to the consent agenda, which is just really the approval of the um, donations valued over our thousand dollars to the McCarthy Town uh, from the McCarthy Town PTSO. Um, that is in your packet. The meeting minutes from our December sixteenth uh, meeting will be available at our next meeting. We'll vote on them then. So, is there a motion to approve the McCarthy Town PTSO donations memo? So moved. So moved. Second. All right, so we've got Kira with the motion and Amy with the second, and we will do a roll call vote in alphabetical order. Everybody get your unmute buttons ready. Evelyn. Yes. Ben. Yes. Kira. Yes. Jenny. Yes. Amy. Yes. Bessa. Yes. John. Yes. Nora. Yes. Andrew. Yes. Myself, yes, with gratitude. Uh, and finally, we have the statement of warrants. Uh, would anybody care to 
make the motion that is on our screen. I move that the school committee vote to approve payroll, payroll warrants as follows. Number P2213 dated 12-16-2001 in the amount of $2,879,915.50. Number P2214 dated 12-30-2021 in the amount of $2,725,712.50. And 46 cents. Payroll deduction warrants as follows. Number 22013 PR dated 12 16 2021 in the amount of $619,711.41. Number 22014 PR dated 12 30 2021 in the amount of $1,411,939.98. Vendor warrants as follows. Follows. Number 2212, dated 12 9 2021, in the amount of $989,491.73. Number 2213, dated 12 23 2021, in the amount of $1,809,882.85. Number 2214, dated uh, 1 6 2022, in the amount of $253,161.93. Student activities warrants as follows. Number 2214JH dated 1-6-2022 in the amount of $2,735.60. Are there more? There's Second. Great. So Kira made the motion. Thank you very much. Seconded by John. I'll make just a friendly amendment that... Uh, Payroll warrant number P2213 is actually dated 12-16-2021, not 2001. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but it's a lot of numbers. So great job, Kira. Thank you very much. I will now uh, call a roll call vote on the um, warrants, starting with Evelyn. Yes. Ben. Yes. Kira. Yes. Ginny. Yes. Amy. Yes. Tessa. Yes. John. Yes. Nora. Yes. Andrew. Yes. And myself. Yes. All right. Uh, Peter, is there anything in the FYI that you wish to share? Um, you can take a look at the auditor's reports. That would be of particular interest. Um, and if after this meeting you're having trouble going to sleep at night, I have a solution for you. Um, you know, we included the school calendar enrollment, um, so you can keep thoughts around that during the budget process. Um, and um, if you still haven't gone to sleep after the auditor's reports, there was this month in the Division of Open Government. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Second. All right. So Kira moved and Amy seconded. And we'll go around one more time. Evelyn? Yes. Ben. Yes. Kira. Yes. Jenny. Yes. Amy. Yes. Tessa. Yes, with gratitude. John. Yes. Nora. Yes. Andrew. Yes. And myself. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Uh, special thanks to Peter, who presented his superintendent's uh, preliminary budget via iPad. Great job, Peter. Thanks, everybody. Good night.